everyone for, for attending the course. My name is uh, Rassan Alibi. I'm a Tunisian well test uh, specialist. I've started working in, uh, in this industry about like 11 years ago. Uh, I was first based in uh, Tunisia, then like I moved uh, internationally. Worked in the North Sea, uh, the Gulf, the Black Sea, West Africa, uh, all over the world with uh, good international experience. So today I would like to, to share with you uh, an introduction to the world of uh, well testing. So uh, the, uh, the course will be uh, divided in two sections, one today and one tomorrow, just to make uh, things a bit uh, lighter and easier to, uh, to assimilate. So uh, first we'll start with uh, an overview of what, test, what uh, well testing is. We'll talk about the well testing objectives, the data acquired during a well test, the well test uh, typical timeline, the crew and the surface layout uh, and examples of it. So you can have like a, uh, an idea of what we're talking about. So what is well testing? Well testing is one of the uh, most common operations that uh, takes place uh, during the life cycle of a well. And uh, it's used to determine the, product, uh, the production capability and the reservoir properties uh, of, a, of a given well. And it's absolutely the only technique allowing uh, the examination under dynamic conditions of, uh, of the reservoir. There are other ways to determine like, the properties of, uh, of a reservoir during drilling, for example, or using a DST or taking samples uh, downhole but it's not under dynamic conditions. The well is not flowing and it's not 100% representative of what the client is going to get during production. And the well testing is uh, performed throughout the life cycle of a well. It, uh, it happens uh, during exploration. So when uh, we just start uh, drilling a well and then we uh, do the open hole test, it can be done during uh, after completion. It can be done also during production, during uh, later interventions or stimulation. So the well test, is always happening uh, during the life cycle of, uh, of a well. So the well testing allows to identify the produced fluids. So we can say we are producing heavy oil, light oil, condensate, what type of gas, how much, and like we measure the, uh, the rates. We are going to uh, monitor also the dynamic reservoir pressure and temperature during uh, drawdowns when you open the well. So we have downhole gauges that will uh, measure exactly the temperature and the pressure. And we also collect uh, samples for PVT analysis. So this happens at surface, and this is happens also downhole. We can take samples downhole. And it's used uh, in PVT models that will allow the reservoir engineer to, uh, to uh, properly assess the capability of a reservoir. So the, the data interpretation is uh, collected. Uh, the data is collected and then interpreted to determine the reservoir parameters, extent, and if we have any like faults in the reservoir that can be detected during uh, the uh, well test. Uh, we can use also that data to, uh, to assess the completion efficiency. So having a smaller uh, or bigger uh, completions can have an impact on the, well, on the way the uh, well behaves at surface and that can be detected. We can also assess the well damage skin factor, for example. Uh, we can also assess the efficiency of uh, workover or stimulation. If we have like a st uh, uh, acid stimulation or we have a reperforation of the uh, reservoir. So doing a well test before the uh, stimulation operation and a well test after will give us uh, an insight uh, on uh, how efficient the uh, stimulation was. And it also can be used to determine if we have interwell communication. So we can do one test in uh, well A and a simultaneous test in well B. And that will give us an idea if uh, the wells are communicating in a single reservoir and how best to, uh, how best to uh, exploit those two wells in order to, uh, to get as much uh, hydrocarbons out of the reservoir in the most efficient manner. And the data acquired during the well test, it's usually pressure and temperature that's downhole and at surface in multiple points of the equipment uh, spread that we'll, we'll see later on when we, uh, we go through uh, each uh, piece of equipment at, uh, at surface and downhole. We get also flow rates for gas, for oil, for water, and sometimes also solid production. This is uh, something we try to, uh, to avoid always, uh, which is a uh, very harsh on the equipment and it's not easy to manage, but sometimes we can't help it and solid is produced. So we need to manage the solids and also uh, measure it. 
We also uh, check the uh, fluid properties. We'll, uh, we'll measure densities, viscosities, composition. There's uh, specific uh, segments in, uh, in testing services in multiple companies that specialize in um, uh, getting the correct uh, composition insight through uh, multiple uh, techniques. And, uh, and it gives us uh, insight on uh, how the well is so behaving when we change chokes, for example. So the fluid samples uh, can be either uh, monophasic fluid samples. That means like we are going to take them downhole at the reservoir pressure before there's any uh, separation. And uh, that's a bit of a complex technique. We can also take pressurized oil and gas samples from, uh, from surface, from separator, for example. And we can also take uh, dead oil and water. Dead means here that there is no uh, gas uh, in oil or in the water samples. And uh, these uh, samples can be used later for uh, further analysis in, in a lab. Uh, guys, if you have any questions, uh, this is like a, it's not a master class. It's, it's all discussion, so we can type your questions over here. The uh, typical well test timeline uh, is represented here by the uh, well head pressure. So we'll see first that we uh, open the well over here. That's for the cleanup. Cleanup means that the well, for example, during, uh, during uh, drilling uh, will be contaminated with drilling fluids. Uh, we'll, we'll still have some solids in there. And it's not 100% representative of the behavior of the reservoir. So we'll need to clean the well up. So this happens through opening the well to the surface. It goes to the flare or, or to a production facility. And during the cleanup phase, we are going to slightly increase the choke size. So we'll, it's like opening a tap slowly, more and more each time. And what happens here is going to start drawing uh, the uh, reservoir fluids from the well bore up to the surface at varying speeds until we reach uh, a point where we know that we have uh, clean uh, fluids coming from the reservoir. We can check this uh, either through uh, measuring the properties of the liquids, for example, the salinity of, uh, of the water produced, if we have stable uh, conditions at surface uh, concerning uh, uh, specific gravities of uh, gas and, uh, and oil and uh, the uh, density of water. So we know that we are producing 100% clean fluids coming from the reservoir. At that point, we will determine the uh, best choke that, uh, that has no depletion. Uh, that's uh, an important piece of information. Right after that, we'll do the first buildup. The buildup is when we close the well in a choke manifold and we start uh, checking, uh, measuring the, uh, the uh, pressure. And that's, that gives us uh, an information about how good the reservoir is, how fast will it, will it recover from the drawdown. And we, uh, in, this, uh, in this graph, we can see, for example, like two, sector, two, sec two segments. There's this part here. This part here, this is like, usually it's uh, concerning the well bore storage effect. Uh, that's uh, how, much, how much that fluid is going to be compressed in the column uh, right before the uh, choke manifold. And then we'll see the stabilization. After that, we'll do multiple uh, tests. This uh, comes uh, basically to the program given by, uh, by the client uh, to see if, uh, to, to, to get in, uh, in line with the uh, test objectives. So it can be uh, multiple chokes determined by uh, the production uh, capability of the, the client in production facility, for example. It can be uh, determined by uh, prior simulations to get uh, the optimal choke. So be flowing at the first choke. That's the first drawdown, second drawdown, and then the final uh, buildup. At the end, we'll see here killing the well. Killing the well means that we are going to inject, uh, I mean, to make things easy, is we are going to inject heavy liquids into the uh, colon that will be higher hydrostatic pressure than the reservoir. So it's going to push all the reservoir fluid down and it will allow us to unset the packer and pull out the uh, DST, the uh, tubing, without having any uh, issue with, uh, with, kick, uh, with a well kick, for example. So this is the basic, uh, the basic timeline for a typical uh, well test operation and DST specifically. The crew that we uh, usually uh, have on site would be uh, th this. This, for example, is like an extended, uh, an extended version of it. 
so we'll have the client representative, uh, the company man, or even like through the presence, physical presence at site or through uh, uh, conf calls and uh, uh, remote monitoring. We will have a well test supervisor, one or two, uh, depends on the uh, the operation. So the core of the uh, the core of the uh, crew would be the surface well test day shift and night shift crew. It's usually composed by a crew chief, which is uh, like a, a specialist or an engineer with uh, with good understanding and experience, plus two operators to operate the rest of the equipment. We'll have also a data acquisition specialist and maybe a multi-phase flow meter specialist too at the same time if we're using uh, MPFMs. That will be, uh, uh, we'll see that later in the presentations. Uh, that would be day and night shift also. Uh, if we have DST, we'll have also DST guys. DST is drill stem testing. That's uh, all the uh, tubing conveyed uh, equipment, packers, uh, downhole valves, uh, stuff like that. If we do have a perforation, that's the TCP. We'll have a TCP guy. Sometimes it's also the same DST guy to do tubing conveyed perforation. We'll have sampling specialist. If we are working also on a semi-submersible, for example, or a drill ship, we'll need a subsea uh, specialist that will handle the uh, subsea equipment. We also have the uh, scent control equipment. I was just saying uh, sometimes we can't help but having a solid set surface. So we'll need probably to use uh, sand filters or cyclonic descenders. So we need sand control people. And of course, all this equipment needs uh, some support equipment uh, too. So like uh, steam, for example, or compressors. And we'll have uh, a dedicated team uh, uh, working with that. This is an example of uh, offshore spread of uh, well test. So as you can see on the left picture, that's our choke manifold that will tackle uh, right uh, after this presentation. Uh, then it goes to a steam exchanger, the one of the uh, support equipment we use, especially if we have heavy oil, for example, or foaming equipment, or foaming uh, oil. So steam is used to, uh, to heat up the fluid and make separation easier. Then we'll go to the separator and then we have surge tanks over here. On the right, you can see one example of uh, HPHG offshore setup. That's high pressure, high temperature. And uh, in this, in the middle of the picture, you can see if we have uh, uh, usually space constraints, we may be able uh, to stack equipment on top of each other. So that's a steam exchanger, that's a separator, and on top of the steam exchanger and the surge tank. We only we not only work onshore, but uh, also. Uh, not only offshore, I mean, and uh, we work also onshore. So uh, on the right, we can see uh, a typical land production testing. And uh, on the left, it's one of the uh, mobile units. Multiple service companies are now working on the production testing uh, uh, field. And uh, lots of them are providing this uh, mobile unit uh, technology. So it's, uh, it's a trailer mounted unit that, uh, gets, uh, that uh, collects choke manifolds, separators, uh, SSV safety equipment, and sometimes also the cabin of the crew uh, doing the uh, during the acquisition, that acquisition. Okay, um, you guys have any uh, questions? You can type them in the chat. Uh, so if we can do a proper well test for our for first well, for example, in a, in a field, and we get uh, good information about the performance of the reservoir, we can then decide if we uh, want to uh, to do uh, to continue drilling, knowing that we have like a good potential or not. It can be used. Uh, that information is uh, can be used uh, to uh, to get uh, the correct sizing of the pipelines, for example. Uh, it can give us like a proper information about uh, what kind of uh, uh, EPF early production facility we want, how big it needs to be. Uh, another question is, uh, when do you get to know if the hole is clean or not? Uh, as I was saying, we check the fluid properties. When you uh, open the well uh, at first, we take samples. We take samples of oil, we take samples of water, and we check the most, uh, the easiest way is to see the salinity of the water. So we'll see uh, that uh, the salinity will vary and stabilize. And we have 
uh, usually uh, very salty water in uh, uh, like if you, for the uh, drilling fluids, we can have the, uh, that information and compare it uh, to the stabilization salinity. And then we tell us, it will tell us that we have a clean, uh, clean well. We'll have less BS and W usually. That means uh, basic sediment and water. So we'll have less and less sediments coming to the surface. Okay, next question is how to determine the best choke size. It's when we have uh, less depletion. That means that we'll, uh, when we open the well at a certain uh, choke size, we can see uh, stabilization in, uh, in pressure. And that can be the optimal choke size for pressure wise. And then uh, depending on the objectives of the, uh, of the client, uh, we can, for example, have the best choke that gives less gas and more oil. So we're not going to lose uh, the uh, gas drive. Gas drive is what pushes oil back to the surface. So the optimal for an oil well, for example, the optimal choke is the choke that allows us to recover most oil with least gas. So that's, uh, that's done during the, the well test. Uh, Shardul is asking, is the uh, well killing and well abandoning the same process? No, no. Well, uh, well killing is uh, to make the well safe. Uh, so we'll inject uh, heavier fluids uh, into the well bore to exceed the downhole pressure of the reservoir. Uh, with the hydrostatic and uh, head pressure. So that will push all the reservoir fluid inside the, the formation and allow us to unset the packer and pick up the DST string without uh, fear of, uh, of a kick. So uh, another question is, um, does well testing also tell about the reservoir drives with a gas or water drive? Yeah, definitely. That's uh, one of the objectives we can see at, uh, at which uh, choke size, for example, choke size means uh, how much uh, DP differential pressure we are applying at, uh, at the uh, well bore phase. It will give us uh, the optimal settings at surface to know that we are not going to, uh, to get mostly water and less oil, for example. So that's a, that's a good piece of information. Uh, Dida is asking, how will you be sure that this is dead oil fluid? Uh, that's uh, opening it to the uh, surface, uh, to the to the atmosphere. Uh, oil, when it comes back, uh, comes from the uh, reservoir, still contains some gas in it. Uh, so it goes into the separator. Separator is operating under pressure, let's say 400, 500, or 600 PSI. Uh, at that moment, it will separate gas and oil. But since we are separating at high pressure, which is like 600 PSI, for example, we still have some gas uh, dissolved in, the, in oil. And when it goes to the search tank, that's the second separation. So we'll have GUR2, gas oil ratio two. It will uh, send some of that gas back to the atmosphere. And when we take a sample in like an open, open container, the remaining gas will just evaporate. Uh, now the question from Sahil is, uh, why on the second drawdown we take sample? Uh, so uh, we take it on the second drawdown or later drawdowns because at that point we know that the liquid coming back from the reservoir is pure and it's not uh, it's not uh, contaminated by uh, by any uh, draining fluids, for example. So when we take samples, we want them to be 100% representative of uh, of the reservoir fluid. Uh, BHS is bottom hole sampling. So there's specialized equipment that is carried through DST string and um, to, to make it easy, it's like a, a sealed bottle that opens at a certain moment uh, when it's uh, deep into the uh, formation and it draws down, uh, like it, the chamber expands slowly and gets filled by uh, monophasic uh, reservoir fluids. And that gum comes back to the surface pressurized and then it's going to be used in the lab. So which type of test do we do in exploration, uh, exploration wells? It's exploration well test. We go there to check uh, the reservoir capability. Okay, Soran is uh, asking, what is the main challenge of DST operation for depleted reservoir, especially when you have uh, four or five meters of pay zone? Example, the beach field in Tunisia. So I think uh, we're getting some specific uh, questions here from, uh, from Tunisian uh, colleagues. Uh, I think if you're asking this specific question, that, that means that you know already what's, uh, what's the challenges, uh, uh, what the challenges are. You have very tight formation here. 
uh, that's uh, that's one uh, one of the challenges. And uh, usually, when when the uh, reservoir is is is, uh, is depleted, uh, it's it's quite tough to get uh, the. For example, if we are talking about monophasic uh, sampling, it's really tough to get a monophasic uh, bottom hole sample if the reservoir is uh, is, is depleted. Uh, second, uh, we always use like uh, artificial lift techniques, and for artificial lift techniques for uh, for depleted uh, for depleted wells, surface sizing is uh, is, is very uh, is very important. So we can get uh, proper uh, measurement of rates without having the issue of slugging, for example. Uh, slugging well is uh, is quite tough to uh, to to test. Uh, Victor is asking, "What is a POOH? That's pull out of hole. It's when we're talking about um, uh, cold tubing, for example. Yeah, pull out of hole. All right. Uh, I think we should uh, uh, jump to the uh, to the next presentation. We can get to the uh, first equipment. Actually, like it's the second equipment uh, going back from uh, from the wellhead. The first would be the wellhead. The second is the uh, the choke manifold and data header. So." So we'll talk now about uh, the first equipment right after the uh, well head or the uh, flow head. So we'll go. It goes first to the data header, and uh, it's, uh, it's associated the accessories. Uh, then we go to the choke manifold, and we'll talk about this function and components, and the basic operation and selection. So the first piece of equipment that uh, the flow goes through is the data header. It's just a simple piece of pipe with threaded inserts in it, uh, threaded points. This allows us to have multiple uh, measure points for pressure, for temperature, where we can uh, connect uh, the dial gauges, uh, short recorders. Uh, we can also uh, have a chemical injection pump, which is usually very important in, uh, in wells with a uh, high rate, especially gas rate. Uh, we can have scent probe sensors. A scent probe sensor is a sensor that is attached to, uh, to the data header, and it measures the erosion caused by uh, by sand production. We'll have thermal wells. Thermal wells are uh, inserts that go into the uh, piece of equipment, in this case, the data header that allows uh, taking the uh, uh, inline temperature and also the data acquisition sensor. Uh, no well test setup is complete without a surface uh, data acquisition uh, network. And uh, the upstream pressure is usually measured here at uh, the data header. The data head is like is later connected straight away to the choke manifold, and the choke manifold is is a very important piece of equipment in well test. It allows to control the flow rate uh, through multi through two uh, choke boxes. One is fixed and one is adjustable. It will prevent the uh, formation sand from entering the well, and this happens by reducing the velocity of uh, of the fluids in uh, in the column. And when we reduce velocity, that means we have less carrying capacity for the uh, sand or uh, solid particles from the reservoir. So it stays in the well, doesn't go to the surface. It also prevents water and gas corning by limiting the flow rate. That's how we control the flow rate through the adjustable or the uh, fixed choke. We control the wellhead pressure uh, and we do the shut-in uh, at surface at the choke manifold. And we ensure critical flow by adjusting the pressure. Critical flow is a, is a flow condition uh, that happens usually, uh, uh, it's uh, when we have the wellhead pressure uh, upstream of the choke manifold is generally uh, double the uh, downstream pressure of the, uh, of the choke manifold. So by adjusting the pressure that way, having uh, this uh, pressure differential, any operation happening downstream of the choke manifold is not going to affect the wellhead pressure, and it's not going to affect the downhole pressure. This is important because, for example, let's say we have uh, we are setting uh, downhole gauges uh, uh, at the reservoir, and we uh, we have we are monitoring the wellhead pressure at the choke manifold, and we want to switch uh, from the separator, for example, straight to the uh, to the flare. For example, I mean one example, or if we are uh, ch changing from one tank to another. Any operation at the uh, downstream of the choke manifold will uh, will uh, will make some uh, pressure uh, fluctuation, and we don't want to see that pressure fluctuation of the uh, normal uh, equipment operating uh, procedures uh, affecting 
the uh, upstream pressure or affecting the uh, downhole uh, pressure. The only way to do that is by ensuring that we have a critical flow. And uh, the second, uh, the, the other option we have is uh, to allow the choke change without uh, shutting, uh, shutting the well. So if we want to change the choke size, we don't have to shut the well and open the choke box and install a new, uh, a new choke bin. We can just switch from the fixed side to the adjustable side, increase the pressure, uh, increase the uh, choke size or decrease it, change the uh, choke bin in uh, the fixed, uh, fixed choke bin, and then switch. This happens, uh, we'll, we'll go through the procedure the, in the, the next slide. So the uh, choke manifold is composed by an inlet, an outlet, and a couple of, uh, of uh, gate valves usually. It can be uh, four gate valves in this example. For example, it can be five, and that means that we have in the middle a bypass valve that allows to bypass totally the choke manifold. Some uh, HPHT, high pressure, high temperature choke manifolds can have uh, up to uh, eight valves. So that's uh, doubling down on, uh, on each uh, side of the uh, choke manifold. We'll have an adjustable choke. Think of a tap that can be uh, uh, opened wide or closed a little bit. And we have a fixed choke size. Uh, the uh, fixed choke is, uh, is a calibrated uh, insert with, uh, with a known, uh, precisely known uh, opening. So it's used mostly for precise measuring. We'll have tapping points for pressure, bleed off or BSW uh, samples. If we want to take a liquid sample, uh, we usually take it uh, upstream of the choke box and it gives us a representation of what kind of fluids is coming uh, at the surface. And we also have thermal wells to, uh, to, detect, to measure the uh, temperature at uh, the choke manifold. Well head pressure for the well head temperature, for example, is very important. That's a good indication that uh, the well is getting uh, cleaned up. When we see a stable uh, well head temperature, that means that we uh, the uh, colder fluid is already gone, and all we have now is a uh, hot fluid coming from the uh, from the reservoir. So the operation uh, of the uh, choke manifold, uh, for example, it requires changing the choke bin. This in red is the uh, fixed choke bin. It is very accurate to, to control uh, the, uh, the well flow because the, uh, the size is continuous all the way through the choke bin. Uh, it's usually used during the main flow period and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it goes up by uh, 264 or 464 inches uh, increments. So uh, each choke manifold will have a choke box full of uh, an assortment of choke bins that we have to uh, we can choose from and uh, install accordingly to the uh, well uh, well behavior and well conditions. The second part is the uh, the adjustable choke, and as I said, it's it can be considered just like a tap. So uh, there is always uh, an insert here, which is like the widest possible insert, it can be a two inch or a three inch insert, and uh, inside the cone is driven by this hand wheel. It goes in and out of this insert. And uh, what does well, what that does is like it increases or reduces the uh, annular opening between the insert, the, uh, the choke, and the, uh, the tip of, uh, of this cone. And this is read on a calibrated uh, reading bar here on the, uh, on the adjustable. So by switching it left or right, we can see how much, how big is the, the opening. And uh, this is usually usually used during the cleanup because it allows the dynamic uh, changing of uh, of the choke size. And uh, if, for example, solids get uh, carried away by the uh, fluids coming from the reservoir and they get stuck, for example, at the uh, seat or uh, at the cone, just rocking the uh, hand wheel will uh, will unstuck them and get them out of the uh, out of the flow path. Uh, controlling the flow, opening and closing of the uh, choke manifold is done through uh, gate valves. Usually, some uh, some companies may use other types of uh, of uh, valves, but the most common one is a gate valve. A uh, gate valve is, I uh, think, of long uh, long slab of metal with a hole in it. If the hole line up lines up with the flow path, flow uh, the well flows, 
If it doesn't, if it's uh, raised and uh, uh, it blocks the uh, flow, it blocks it and the well is shut in. Uh, it's usually used by one of the reasons we use uh, usually uh, gate valves is because they uh, allow to use uh, higher pressures, can go to 5, 10, or even 15,000 psi, and they have uh, excellent sealing properties. That's why it's one of the industry standards. So, changing from the adjustable uh, to the fixed uh, choke. This is what I was talking about uh, earlier in the presentation. Uh, one of the uh, advantages of using a choke manifold with two uh, choke boxes. So in the first uh, picture, we can see that we are flowing through the, uh, through the uh, adjustable side. So the, what is in red is what is pressurized. So the upstream, this is the upstream valves. This is the second upstream valve. And these are the downstream valves. We are doing that. We are calling them upstream and downstream compared to the choke box. So in this case, the upstream valve of the fixed choke is closed. The downstream valve of the fixed choke is closed, and both upstream and downstream valves of the adjustable are opened. So the well is flowing through the adjustable to the surface equipment. So if we want to change the, uh, the choke box. For example, we'll have to open the downstream valve on the fixed side that will allow pressure from downstream of the uh, adjustable choke to pressurize this area. Then what we'll do is two operators. One will start opening the, uh, the uh, upstream valve of the fixed choke. The other guy will start closing the uh, upstream valve of the adjustable. And they do this while watching the upstream pressure of the choke and the downstream pressure of the choke. So if they do it properly, and according to, uh, to the regulation, we will not, will have like minimal uh, perturbation of the, uh, of the uh, wellhead pressure. Once that done, that the uh, upstream of the adjustable uh, size is uh, closed, and this one is open, the flow will be flowing through the fixed choke. And then we close the downstream valve of the adjustable and take it out and inspect it for damage. Because uh, every time the, uh, the chokes are changed, we have to inspect the tip of the, uh, of the, uh, of the stem of uh, the adjustable size to, uh, for, for damage. It can be damaged by sand, uh, by high flow rates, uh, it can be broken off due to vibration, so it needs to be checked. The uh, criteria of uh, selection usually for choke manifolds are pressure rating. They can be 5, 10,000, 15,000 PSI, can go even to, to 20,000 PSI. Temperature rating to see if it can handle uh, high temperatures or not. ID and connection. ID and connections are very important here because it's, uh, it's also uh, very important to, uh, to the uh, rate that it can handle. A uh, smaller ID does not ha handle the uh, high rates. If we have very high rates, we have to, to go for a bigger ID uh, choke manifold, way more than three. It can go even to six inches or, or higher. Another requirement is the H2S service. Uh, most of the equipment in uh, service companies now is, uh, most of it is H2S uh, service compliant, can be uh, called sour service. Uh, the issue is with H2S is it's it's can it can cause pitting in uh, in, uh, in equipment, it can cause cracks, it can cause uh, leaks, and anything with H2S is usually super dangerous. Uh, it can be lethal at uh, low dose, so uh, the equipment needs to be H2S service uh, uh, equipped. And a bypass valve. Bypass valves are sometimes required, and that's the fifth valve I was talking about earlier in the presentation. It goes in the middle and it bypasses the, uh, the choke boxes. So safety considerations. Uh, always open one valve before closing another. This is uh, one of the uh, uh, basic uh, basic uh, information that the newcomers to well test uh, have to learn. Because if you close one valve before, uh, before opening another path for the uh, for the fluids to go, you'll have an increase in pressure, and sometimes it can lead to, uh, to bad things happening, <laughs> to, to, say, to say it lightly. 
we always count the number of turns to open and close gate valves. Uh, gate valves have a known number of turns uh, to fully open or fully closed. Failing to, uh, to get that exact number means that the gate is, clo uh, is clogged with uh, probably sand or, or grease or something. So uh, what happens is uh, we need to, uh, to count the number and know if it's fully open or fully closed. Um, never flow through the choke manifold without a choke or a seat in place because this will, uh, this will uh, totally destroy the threads of, uh, of the choke box. Uh, next, do not use an adjustable choke to stop the flow. That's, uh, that's a very dangerous uh, thing. Uh, it can happen by mistake if you are reducing the, uh, the, uh, the choke size slowly. And uh, what happens is the stem can be stuck due to the differential pressure into the, uh, the uh, choke bin seat. And uh, that's like closing uh, the well at the choke, uh, adjustable choke. And that thing is not made to, uh, to support pressure. So it can break the stem and it will, uh, it will get the uh, adjustable choke stuck. And the only way to unstuck it is actually to close the well. And that's the last thing you want to do because you're using a choke manifold with two sides basically to, to avoid having to do that. We only use brass and copper hammers to prevent sparks. The caps that hold the uh, adjustable uh, choke and the uh, fixed side are uh, hammer unions. So you, you, you connect the threads and then you hammer on the wings of the, uh, of the, uh, of the nut to, uh, to tighten it. So the hammer we use are brass and copper, and that prevents the uh, creation of sparks. For obvious reasons, if we have sparks at a place where we are taking samples, uh, it can be a, a, a hazard of uh, explosion hazard. Next, we always bleed off pressure before changing choke. Uh, this is a no-brainer. No when you close both sides of the uh, upstream and downstream uh, valve of the, uh, of the choke manifold to change, for example, the uh, fixed side uh, choke uh, inserts, we bleed off because there might be uh, some pressure there. And if you open the cap with pressure in there, it's dangerous. We stay also upwind when we take samples. Uh, this is extremely important, especially if we have uh, H2S. If we have H2S, we'll probably be using uh, respirators, uh, but uh, we stay upwind so that the dangerous for the uh, gases will go with the wind, not to, not, not to our lungs, hopefully. All right. Do you guys have any, uh, any questions? Let's check the chat. For something, okay. How often should you perform the function equipment pressure test? Is it from job to job or should it periodically. Uh, okay, so for example, for, for choke manifold here, uh, we, we, there's always two things uh, to consider. One is the company policy. So some companies will have a regular maintenance schedule for pressure testing and uh, inspection and maintenance. And that's done usually every, uh, every year. And uh, for pressure testing the equipment on site, it's when we first connect the equipment together, finish the rig up, and uh, and that uh, that's basically it. You, you do the rig up and you do your pressure test. If you're talking about long duration uh, well test, extended well test that can last for a year or two years, that's uh, usually get uh, the uh, it's an agreement between the service company and the client to to see how often uh, they need to to do the pressure test. Next uh, question from uh, Mio. Uh, normally when we have to use the fixed choke and the adjustable choke. Uh, as a rule of thumb, adjustable chokes are used during uh, cleanup because it's easier to control the well because during the cleanup, the well is not yet stable. Uh, and uh, it's used during uh, the uh, operation of uh, increasing or decreasing the fixed choke. Uh, I'll come back to that later. Fixed chokes are used mainly during uh, the uh, main flow phase uh, main drawdown because the uh, we uh, have absolute certitude of the size of the choke. It's a precise measurement, so we do that for the main flow. Then the adjustable choke is used when we change the uh, fixed choke. 
say, for example, we are flowing at uh, 3264 stroke size, and we want to increase to, uh, to uh, 40. So what we do is we switch from 32 fixed to 32 adjustable. So now we are using the adjustable. We increase from 32 to 40 through the adjustable because it's manual. Install a new 40 uh, choke fixed and then switch back to the fix. Uh, Ibim is asking what is a critical flow? As I said, uh, to simplify, critical flow is a flow condition that allows us to operate downstream equipment of choke without affecting wellhead pressure or downhole pressure. So uh, for, for gas wells, it can be, uh, for, for oil wells, it can be a half of the pressure or 0 0.6 for, for, the, uh, for gas wells. How will you change the beam while you're changing the, the flow rate as much? I'm not, um, can we uh, rephrase the question? Uh, I don't think I see what, what's the point here. Change the beam while changing the flow rate. Oh yeah, that's, that's the adjustable. It's like a tap, we open and, uh, and close. Victoria is asking uh, how to change from adjustable to fix again, okay? We'll go back here. So you guys are seeing the graph. Now we are flowing through the adjustable. Upstream and downstream of the fix are closed. So if you want to switch from the adjustable to the fix, what you do is you open downstream valve of the fixed side this allows pressure, downstream pressure to equalize. And then what happens is you will have two people, one opening and one closing the upstream valve of the choke. This will force the flow to go through the fixed. Then you close the downstream valve of the adjustable, bleed off and inspect the, uh, the adjustable side. Next question is from Sahil. Which size of the adjustable choke should be present? Um, absolutely no preference here. It can be to the left, it can be to the right. Sometimes it's uh, it's, uh, it's it's done on site, uh, depending on the uh, uh, on the uh, set configuration. Uh, I've worked in some offshore installations where it's like super tight, and uh, you need to to put the uh, the adjustable in one side because it's easier to access from that uh, that position. What he's asking. How good is it to use adjustable track uh, choke in, uh, in gas wells? Um, again, it depends on, uh, on the flow rate. If you're talking about a gas, uh, a gas well that is producing 30, uh, 30 million scuffs a day, uh, it's totally okay to use uh, the, uh, the adjustable if, it's, if there's no erosion, there's no uh, sand production. So it should be okay. But during the main flow, that's very important. During the main flow, you always want to use the, uh, the fixed choke. So if you're having a, like an extremely high rate, uh, over 60 or 70 million scuffs a day, uh, adjustables, uh, adjustable chokes can be tricky because they can be eroded. And if they get eroded, first thing you need to, uh, to focus on is like reading the upstream pressure and downstream pressure. If you see the upstream pressure decreasing and the downstream pressure of the choke increasing, that means that you are uh, basically eroding away the tip and increasing the, the choke size uh, without knowing it. Bino is asking, is it possible to identify the reservoir extension? Uh, that's done after the interpretation of well test data. Sorani is asking, do you have to avoid creating back pressure on the well while changing from fixed to adjustable? Yes. Uh, that's why I said when you change from one side to another, you have to keep an eye on uh, upstream and downstream pressure to avoid uh, any disturbance. To, uh, this is uh, very important, especially for low flow rates, because if you uh, or if you have like artificial lift, if you close too quickly or uh, the, uh, the the valves, you'll uh, get back pressure to the to the uh, to the well. That can lead to uh, to multiple bad things that can happen. Let's say it that way. Shazad is asking, uh, as well test provides data about petrophysical data like porosity, uh, why we go to taking rock sample and take tests on it? Uh, because nothing actually beats uh, in situ measurement. That's why well test is better, for example, for uh, dynamically uh, appraising the reservoir than, uh, for example, uh, MDT, taking uh, measurements while drilling, because it's taking the real measurement of how much is going to flow, for example. 
And uh, if we want to uh, take a rock sample, we don't only do porosity. There's lots and lots of other tests that can be done in the lab. And uh, the physical uh, physical uh, test of uh, a rock sample is way more accurate than uh, the uh, porosity uh, data that can be uh, 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 can be deduced from a well test. Because uh, now we're talking about porosity deduced from the data provided by well test. Uh, Jorge is asking if we can have presentation by sending to email address. Uh, this can be checked uh, later due with, uh, with the association. Uh, next uh, question from Sahil. Do we install high low pressure pilots valves? Yes, we'll, uh, we'll check that later in the uh, next presentation. Uh, Mohamed Amrani is asking uh, why we change from uh, adjustable to fixed choke. Uh, this is, uh, we do that either to inspect the adjustable side, so we have to switch to, uh, to the fixed, or to, uh, to increase or decrease the fixed side uh, choke during the main flow. Fidel is asking, what are the safety precautions when changing the fixed choke? Uh, one of the, uh, uh, like, there's a step-by-step -step procedure to, uh, to change a choke, and it's uh, based on like the hazards uh, in, the, uh, in play. So one of the first hazards is pressure. So when we want to change uh, the adjustable or fixed choke, we need to make sure that valves are closed, upstream and downstream valves are fully closed. Uh, then we need to stay upwind and open the sampling point to allow any buildup of pressure to, uh, to be uh, released. So do not open the, uh, the choke box without absolutely making sure that there is no, uh, no pressure inside, no trapped pressure. That's the first thing. Sometimes in some wells with high pressure, high temperature, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, chokes can be extremely hot. So use proper gloves, proper PPE. That's one thing. Uh, also, some of the fluids can be corrosive. Uh, you, you can be doing this during an acid stimulation. So again, the proper PPE needs to be, uh, to be used. Okay, uh, Shardul is asking if the sand corrodes the valves, equipment, and the arrangements, uh, and how to, uh, to control it. First thing is, uh, if we are detecting uh, sand production at surface, uh, we want to reduce the choke size. Reducing the choke size will reduce the velocity of the, uh, the flow rate, thus the velocity of fluids coming back from the reservoir. And when that happens, we have less carrying capacity. It doesn't carry as much sand back to the surface. That's the first, uh, first thing. Second thing, sometimes it can't, uh, can't be helped. Sometimes we, uh, the, the well is producing uh, solids anyway. You reduce or you do not reduce the, the, uh, the pressure is not going to change anything. In that case, we have to have sand control equipment. Uh, this includes sand filters and uh, sand separators. It can have also uh, cyclonic descenders and that will uh, remove up to 99% of the uh, sand production and trap it inside these, uh, these vessels to be disposed of properly later. Uh, Ibim is asking, do we use mud fluid to maintain the well pressure when changing choke? No, no, no. Uh, for changing, uh, changing si uh, choke size, we just switch from one fixed to a, from the fixed side to an adjustable. Does it mean if we have a negative delta on the upstream and downstream pressure, does it mean we have a restriction of flow from the well? Uh, I don't understand this question. Usually we have the upstream pressure is higher than the downstream pressure of the choke. But uh, if for some reason, uh, the upstream and downstream pressure of the choke, this is extremely rare, it should not uh, actually happen. But if the pressure is equalizing between upstream and downstream pressure, that means you have a blockage somewhere upstream of the choke uh, that is smaller than the choke size. Next question is how do you determine uh, the volume of oil producing gas well? Uh, we'll go to the separator lately. This is coming in the next presentations. Is the choke manifold connected to the plant control system? Uh, usually no, uh, only in some cases where the uh, choke contains uh, hydraulically actuated valves, but uh, what can be attached to the control system of the uh, plant usually is the SSD and 
that's what uh, the SSV, and this is what we are going to talk about in the next presentation. Next question is from Sahil. Is uh, sand control and sand control equipment uh, upstream or downstream choke? Usually it's upstream of the choke because uh, we'll, we'll have to deal with, uh, with, uh, with uh, we won't have to deal with the erosion of, uh, of the choke manifold tip, uh, for example. <clears throat> Okay, uh, last question is uh, the difference between downhole well test and surface well test. Uh, actually, it's not a downhole well test. Well test is only done at surface. Uh, what usually people think of uh, downhole well test is like taking samples and doing measurements uh, through uh, the, uh, uh, the drilling uh, equipment. There's some technologies that allow the measurement of porosity uh, and also taking uh, some samples uh, in situ or uh, assessing the uh, properties of the reservoir while drilling, but it's not it's nowhere near as uh, precise and uh, and uh, efficient than the, uh, the well test. Properly flowing the uh, the the well to get the uh, the informations uh, we need. All right. So we'll uh, after the choke. Now we'll uh, just go to the uh, next presentation. Okay, can you guys see my presentation here? The, uh, the control uh, of uh, platform control of uh, some of the safety equipment on the surface or uh, surface well test. This is what we're talking about right now. It's the ESD systems and surface safety valves. So uh, now we'll talk about what an ESD is, emergency shutdown system. What are the components? What is the SSV valve? the surface safety valve, uh, the emergency shutdown, and the safety considerations. So we always want one way or another to quickly shut down a well in case of emergencies. This can be uh, a sudden and uncontrolled release of uh, pressure of, uh, or rupture of piping or, or the opening of one of the uh, safety valves downstream of the choke. So it's always important to have one way to close the well automatically from a distance or using uh, some other control measures. So the uh, quick shutdown uh, is, uh, is normally done in less than 10 seconds. So if we activate the ESD, the well is totally closed in less than 10 seconds. And the system is composed of an ESD panel, emergency shutdown panel. We'll have also hydraulic actuated valve, that's the SSV. We will have a number of high-low pilots uh, connected with air hoses to the uh, to the ESD panel. This is in case of uh, using an ESD with uh, uh, pneumatic uh, control. Sometimes there's uh, ESDs with the uh, electrical control. We'll talk about that uh, later. And then uh, remote stations. Remote stations are placed uh, throughout the uh, well test area and close to uh, maybe uh, some uh, very important uh, places like the uh, coffee shop. <laughs> Uh, that's where people can be uh, expected to be and uh, noticing maybe something wrong and they can push the button or pull it, depending on the uh, model, to uh, activate the ESD. So how the ESD works? The ESD station is connected uh, with the hydraulic hoses to the uh, uh, hydraulic valves in the flow head and to the uh, surface safety valve and sometimes to other uh, uh, valves depending on the design. It controls the flow line valve on the flow head and the safety valve and kill valve. So the, to close and open uh, the, uh, these valves, it can be accessed uh, manually from the ESD console or from the remote stations. There's like a pull button. Usually it is a pull so that uh, if someone is walking by the, uh, the ESD station and bumps into it, he does not close the well inadvertently. So it needs to be uh, conscient uh, and uh, deliberate uh, pull to, uh, to activate the, uh, the ESD. So that's manual. There's also an automatic closure. And this happens through the use of uh, pressure high-low pilots. 
So the high low pilots will activate the ESG depending on, uh, on their setting point, if the pressure increases or decreases compared to a set point. And uh, so to uh, usually to apply, uh, to open the valve, you need to apply pressure. That's uh, a fail safe system. That means that if for some reason we lose uh, hydro, uh, the pneumatic uh, actuation of the ESG, for, for example, the compressors go down or there is a major catastrophe on the well site, what happens is the air supply goes off. And when the air supply goes off, it will bleed off, uh, it will bleed off the uh, ESG. And then the release pressure from ESG console to, uh, to close the valve. So this is one example of uh, ESG consoles. As you can see in the picture here on the left side of the console, there is multiple hoses going in. There is an air supply. There is air supply go air, air hoses going to the uh, multiple stations and uh, and uh, high low pilots. And there is also hydraulic hoses going from the uh, the uh, panel from the uh, ESG uh, station to uh, the uh, hydraulic valves. That's the uh, kill line, for example, and the uh, flow line of uh, flow head or the SSV. It uses pressurized air from uh, regular equipment or compressor provided by the service company. In the uh, spread, it's usually placed somewhere near the choke manifold and the, uh, the safety valve. You can see it here in the picture, uh, circuit in red. And the, the uh, ESD stations, the pull, uh, pull buttons are usually placed near the major equipment. So we'll have near the separator, it can be near also the search tank, sometimes near the uh, acquisition cabin and the uh, company men's office. <coughs> uh, most, the, uh, most of uh, service companies now have uh, some kind of shot that says when the ESG is, uh, is mandatory. <coughs> most of the time, if we have H2S, not most of them, if you have H2S, ESG is mandatory because uh, the uh, release of H2S in the atmosphere is a uh, is dangerous business. And sometimes you cannot really run to the choke manifold and close the well if there's a release of gas for obvious safety reasons. So you can be, uh, you, you have to be able to do it from, from distance. So ESG is mandatory in that case. If the wellhead pressure is, is high, also that's one of the reasons you have an ESD because if there is a sudden increase of pressure, uh, operating a gate valve at uh, more than 5,000 PSI, it's, it's tough. So we'll need a quick way to close using a, an SSV. And also for high flow rate. If you have high flow rates of uh, especially gas, uh, if we have a sudden release of fluids at surface, you will have absolutely no time to react to, uh, to close the well because it happens so fast and the volumes, uh, the volumes of uh, liquids or fluids being uh, diverse is, is huge. So you need an ESD for that one. So the components, you'll have uh, a bunch of hydraulic hoses. Uh, usually it's two, one for, uh, for the SSV and one going to the flow head, but it can actuate much more than that. Uh, you will have uh, at the side of the panel an air inlet coming from uh, either rig compressors or the service company compressors. And uh, one important thing is they have to be labeled and locked out. So no one from the rig crew or anyone by mistake can, uh, can close the air supply on, uh, on the ESD. You'll have pilot, uh, pilot hoses. Those go to either high-low pilots or the uh, stations uh, or erosion probes. That's uh, the sand probes we uh, use to detect uh, sand erosion. If those activate, they will just close the well to avoid damage to, uh, to surface well test equipment. And you'll have the uh, hydraulic uh, outlets going to the uh, actuated uh, to the valves. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so this is one of the uh, models of, uh, of uh, ESDs. Now, this specific one is uh, the one used by uh, Schlumberger. So we'll have multiple pumps inside. So we'll have multiple uh, pressure reading gauges for, for those pumps, uh, air supply pressure, and the ESD uh, circuit uh, pressure, and the buttons to, to activate the, uh, uh, the pumps and start opening the well, uh, opening the uh, SSVs. <clears throat> As you can see inside, 
there might be multiple uh, multiple uh, pumps, hydraulic pumps actuated by air. That's the regulators here, and the uh, the air supply to pneumatic uh, circuit, and a tank with uh, hydraulic fluid that is used to feed the pumps. That in turn will feed the uh, the ear, the uh, SSVs and the uh, and the valves on the flow head. Uh, one of the guys mentioned the Hilo pilots uh, in the questions, so there they are. So what are Hilo pilots? <clears throat> Hilo pilots are safety devices that are connected to the uh, SS ESD <coughs> that will allow to close the well if uh, a certain threshold of pressure is either exceeded or uh, falls below it. So a high pilot is going to activate the uh, uh, ESD when the pressure increases beyond its set point. Example, we can install a high pilot downstream of the choke manifold at uh, one typical is uh, setting is 1,300 PSI. Separators usually run at 1,440 PSI and you don't want to overpressurize the uh, vessel. So what you do is you install uh, a high pilot set at 13,000, uh, 1,300 PSI downstream of the uh, choke manifold. So uh, what that does is if for some reason uh, the pressure increases downstream of the choke beyond 1,300, the high pilot will trip and close the, the, uh, the uh, SSV and shut in the well before the pressure increases way beyond uh, the working pressure of the equipment it is protecting. So that's high pilot. Low pilot does the, uh, the opposite thing. So we, for example, we'll install a low pilot downstream of the choke and we set it at 300 PSI or 200 PSI. So if the pressure downstream of the choke is above 200, it is okay. So we have fluid passing through and it's pressurized. If for some reason, excuse me, <coughs> if for some reason the pressure downstream of the choke manifold drops below 200, that is not normal. That means two things, either the choke manifold is blocked. So we have uh, probably sand blocking the choke or, uh, or a piece of rubber. Sometimes I've seen this happen. Pieces of packer uh, get detached and come back to the surface and get stuck in the choke box. So that's not good. So it will close well. And the second uh, case, which is uh, one of the main reasons we use low pilots, it's the danger of pipe rupture. If, for example, a pipe ruptures between the choke and the separator, the pressure will drop below 200. And in that case, if there's a big leak or rupture of the piping, you won't have time to, uh, to close the well or the option to do, uh, to do so. So the low pilot will detect a pressure drop below 200, activate the ESD, and the ESD will close the SSV, and everyone is safe. So high pilots and low pilots are set and calibrated at the base according to, uh, to the well test design. And uh, then it's, uh, it's implemented in well sites. And it's usually checked by the clients also because it's a safety device. So this is how it works usually. Uh, the, uh, there's, like a, there's a piston inside the high, pilot, high low pilot with the uh, O-rings and then a, uh, a path for the air to flow through. And depending on the way you connect the, uh, the air hoses, is it, it's to the top or to the bottom of uh, that canal, you can set the high pilot to, uh, to a high or low pilot. And uh, when you do that at the base with uh, while using an ESD station and, uh, and a supply of uh, pressurized uh, fluid, you can set the, uh, the high pilot or low pilot by turning this top cover, turning up or turning down to increase or decrease the uh, spring tension that pushes the piston down or up. So ESD safety considerations, it must be installed in an easily accessible area. So the recrew can have a periodic look at the gauges. So uh, one of the uh, common causes of uh, trips usually is uh, if somebody messes up with, uh, with the air supply and you can see if the air supply is dwindling by just looking at the gauge. So you put the ESD uh, in somewhere visible to everyone to, to, uh, to make sure that uh, they know where the ESD station in case of uh, emergency and to check on, uh, on the uh, pressure levels. The ST stations must be installed close to each rigged main equipment and escape routes. So it's usually placed, the uh, buttons actually, the actual buttons. You'll have one at the separator, 
one at the acquisition cabin, one at the rig floor, if uh, you, we are operating on, on a rig, uh, one by the company man, the office, that's uh, very important. And uh, also in, uh, next to some gathering point or next to a, uh, a master point. So in case of emergency, if people are in the master point, they can pull the button. They must be visible and uh, installed at suitable height. So can everyone connect to it, the system with that uh, specific equipment? This means that you do not install them very high so they cannot be uh, operated or very low so they can people can bump in them. Uh, a flat and stable area must be provided for the ESD console. This is very important because keep in mind, it's, uh, it's a set of pumps and a reservoir. So if the uh, area it's installed on is wobbly or inclined, maybe the pumps will uh, lose prime and not suck uh, enough uh, pressure, uh, enough uh, fluids to, uh, to, uh, to activate the pumps. A grout connection must be available close to the console. Uh, this is also very important. So remember guys, every time you have fluids moving through a pipe or through a hose, you will always have some kind of electric, static, uh, static electricity. So uh, all the equipment of uh, well test spread needs to be properly grounded and uh, uh, electrically grounded. So next uh, is the uh, the valve itself, the uh, surface safety valve. It's used to shut in the well, upstream of the choke manifold. It's operated by the ESD through a hydraulic hose. Uh, the uh, It's equipped with a hydraulic actuated fail-safe gate valve. What that means is, for some reason, it loses the, uh, the hydraulic pressure. It's going to close automatically. So the bottom part is the valve, the top part is the actuator, and there's like a spring inside to push the gate down and uh, get the, uh, the flow uh, going, you need pressure. If you lose that pressure for some reason, that means you lost control of your equipment. In that case, the pressure is bled off, the gate goes up, the well is closed. That's uh, the meaning of fail safe. So there's the position of the safety valve. It's between the flow head and, and uh, the choke manifold. Usually it's equipped also with uh, a tapping point upstream. So it's somewhere here. Uh, and that means in case of closure of the safety valve, the trapped pressure between the flow head and the safety valve can be bled off properly without, uh, without requiring uh, opening the SSV to the choke manifold. So the components are an inlet, an outlet, it can be winged, in this case, Waco connection, or it can be uh, flanged. In this case, we take off these two parts and connect it uh, flange to flange, or any type of other connections. A supporting base frame. The base frame can be sometimes for, uh, for space saving uh, requirements, it can be removed. It's just a lifting frame and the hydraulic actuator. Inside, as I said, we have a spring and the gate valve. That spring, uh, is always pushing up. So to counteract that, you need to apply pressure either through the uh, handheld uh, pump or the, uh, the ESZ. So it pushes on this piston and that compresses the spring and forces the gate to go down with a, with a hole that allows the, uh, the flow to pass. If we have no pressure, spring pushes back and then the, uh, the, uh, the gate goes up, blocks the flood path and we're good. So uh, the operating pressure of the, uh, of the valve itself can be 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 or 20,000 PSI. But the actuating pressure used for the actuator is around 3,000 PSI, 2,500 PSI. So uh, that needs to be checked uh, regularly because of uh, one of the failure modes of the uh, actuators is overpressurizing the, uh, uh, the actuator. This can happen due to, uh, to heat expansion. So uh, you saw in the pictures that most of these hoses are black and uh, because they're made of uh, special rubber. And uh, in, uh, in some hot countries, just like in Tunisia, for example, or Algeria or some other hot countries, uh, laying down those uh, cables on the sun will increase slowly and slowly the pressure of the, uh, of the, uh, of the hydraulic uh, fluid inside. And that can go beyond the maximum pressure of 3,100 PSI. Depends on the manufacturer, by the way. So you always need to check regularly the pressure of uh, your gauges 
and uh, bleed off a little bit of that uh, excess pressure if needed. The ESD will compensate for low pressure, but it's usually not able to compensate for a high increase uh, of uh, hydraulic pressure, except uh, if it is equipped with, uh, with a pop-off valve, which is not always the case. Some, uh, some service companies do not use those, uh, those valves. So the uh, SSV criteria selection uh, the, is usually based on uh, either the uh, pressure uh, required, the presence of H2S. As I said, if you have H2S, we always use uh, SSV and uh, ESD. And, uh, and the, also the ID. If you have a uh, high rate, you will match the ID of the choke manifold. For four inch, of, uh, four inch if you are using a four inch choke or six inch if you are using a six inch choke. Any question, guys? Okay, uh, guys, can you hear me? Just saw this uh, as a question. Uh, my voice isn't clear. Oh, okay. So, uh, question from uh, Mohammed: Can I isolate the air supply flowing to the ESD panel? Uh, I strongly advise against that because, uh, first of all, uh, ESDs are not uh, sealed totally. So if you uh, close the uh, if you close the uh, air supply, uh, the air pressure inside the ESD will decrease slowly, a little bit by a little bit. There is a specific valve in the ESD. It's called the compensation valve that will allow small amounts of uh, pressurized air uh, to go into the system to compensate for small leaks. So if you isolate the air supply, it will probably stay up for, depends on how the, you set up your, uh, your ESD. It can be up for one hour and then it will trip. And uh, if you have uh, an air compressor uh, issue, that means that you are not running your separator at the same time. So that's, uh, that's kind of dangerous, you know? Uh, Nesway is asking if we, uh, about the factors that can activate high-low pilots. Okay. Uh, I'll go back to the uh, specific part of the presentation. So high pilots, uh, they're called high because they will activate the ESD when the pressure goes high. So if you set the pilot at 3000 PSI, if pressure goes beyond 3000 PSI, it will activate the ESD and the ESD will close the SSV. Low pilots will activate for low pressure. If you set your low pilot at 200 PSI, if the pressure goes below less than 200 PSI, it will activate the ESD, and the ESD will close the SSV. Nadita is asking if we can have a certificate. Uh, yes, I think, but uh, you'll have to check with, uh, uh, with the guys who organize the course. Satish is asking, is the SSV different from the SSV in accessory? Uh, technically, no. Uh, it's, uh, it's exactly the same uh, operating principle. You'll have an actuator and you have a valve, but uh, the Christmas tree is part of the, uh, of the well, you know, but uh, the SSV is part of the uh, surface testing equipment. Uh, it's, uh, if the SSV, is, if, if the wellhead or Christmas tree is equipped with an SSV, it can be uh, substituted for the SSV from the surface, but this depends on uh, the client policy and the service company policy. And it's always good if, uh, if possible to have multiple safety devices. So uh, it could be, uh, we could have an SSV from the Christmas tree and an SSV in the, uh, the well test uh, spread. And in case we don't have a Christmas tree and we have a flow head uh, for, for DST operations, there's already a kill line valve, which is uh, a, a valve with a, a flow line valve with, uh, with actuator there, substituting this, uh, the uh, safety valve on the Christmas tree. Uh, Ibim is asking, why is BOP not involved in the ESC system? Because uh, BOPs are not part of the well test, uh, well test spread. So, uh, this is here a question of accountability. Uh, each uh, service is accountable for their equipment. So attaching the BOP to the uh, ESD panel uh, should either fall uh, under the guidelines of a client if he asks to it, uh, is uh, if he asks for it. Uh, otherwise, it's not usually connected. BOP are held and uh, and operated by the uh, rig crew, 
and ESDs are operated by the uh, Wealthest uh, well team. Sahil is asking, is uh, all high pilots are set at the same pressure? No. Uh, so the uh, high pilots and low pilots are calibrated depending on needs. So for example, I can have, uh, uh, during the design phase of the, uh, of the well test, I, will, uh, I need to install high pilots between each two equipments that have unmatching operating pressure. Example. Choke manifolds, for example, it's uh, rated at 10,000 PSI. So whenever the pressure is below 10,000, the equipment is safe. But right after this choke manifold, I'm going straight to a separator that operates at 1440 PSI. So for if for any reason, the pressure goes beyond uh, that uh, set point of 1440 PSI, I'm going to damage my separator. It's not going to damage the choke because the choke is rated 10,000. So for that, a discrepancy of working pressure, I need to install a high pilot. So I'm going to calibrate that high pilot at 1300 PSI. Then going from the choke method from the separator, which is set at 1440 to, for example, uh, a tank. That tank is uh, rated, for example, at 150 PSI. So I'm going to install another high pilot between the, uh, between the uh, uh, tank and the separator to protect the, uh, the uh, search tank from overpressure from the separator. So the set points are not, uh, are not something fixed. It's something that it's taken care of during the design phase. And they are calibrated prior to, uh, prior to the operation. Wendy is asking, the SSV principle is the same like uh, are the subsurface control controls the safety of having completion string, yeah. Does it purpose the same like in offshore example to close well in case platform being hit by a sea truck, you mean a ship? Yes, uh, it's, it's a safety device allowing the closure of, the, uh, of a well in case of uh, emergencies. So uh, it's, it's almost the same, uh, same principle, but it's not doing the same, uh, it's not doing it on the same way. Usually uh, tubing conveyed valves uh, are not gate valves. They, uh, they have a ball in, inside, the kind of a ball valve, and they're not actuated in the same manner. But they save, uh, they kind of use the, uh, the same purpose. Uh, Yassine is asking, what are the other measures or tools used in case of SSV fails? Uh, so uh, uh, usually we won't have, if we're doing a DST, we'll have two uh, hydraulically actuated valves. That's the SSV, uh, which is independent from the flow head and, uh, and flow line in the flow head. And those are two. So if one fails to close for some reason, if someone is tampering it with it, or the uh, the uh, there is a valve isolation which is isolated, the other one will activate. Otherwise, we still always have the possibility of the of closing the well at the choke manifold in case of emergency. That's why he's asking. I meant the actual factors for activation of our pellets. For example, you mentioned the low pressure that could activate. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, and now I understand your question. So, uh, for example, the causes for high pilot activation. Uh, let's say we are flowing the well. Wellhead pressure is 5,000 PSI. Uh, separator pressure is 600. And then someone passes by and closes the outlet of the separator. Gas outlet, for example. So the pressure will increase quickly in the separator. It goes from 600 to, to 1,000 and then reaches uh, 1,300. The high pilot will activate, close the well, and save the day. Because if the pressure keeps increasing, we may have uh, explosion issues. If, for example, safety valve doesn't activate. Low pilot, same thing. We are flowing. We have 5,000 PSI uh, well head pressure. And then uh, 600 PSI uh, downstream pressure going to the separator. Suddenly, uh, there's a big leak in the line between the choke and the separator. Uh, so that will drop the pressure well below the set point of the low pilot. So what, what happens is the, the well is closed and everyone is safe. Another possibility is for the low pilot to activate is if there is a blockage between the low pilot and the uh, choke manifold. So the pressure will start increasing quickly and it can reach the rupture point of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the piping. But before that, because the pressure is decreasing after the blockage, the low pilot will activate and close the well. Next question from Shardul, how does ESD work when there is an equipment failure with no pressure fluctuation? 
uh, usually, uh, now I understand what you're, you're asking. Uh, usually if there's like a, an equipment failure, uh, it's accompanied by a pressure drop or pressure increase of, uh, of, uh, of some sort. That's the uh, main giveaway. Uh, for example, if uh, the uh, automatic control valve of, uh, of the separator is malfunctioning, it stays closed or stays fully open, you will see pressure fluctuation because we are dynamically flowing the well. Any malfunction will cause uh, fluctuation in pressure. For example, if we have uh, lots of sand coming through our sand filtering system and it blocks the, the screens, we will see will detect that through pressure fluctuation. So always uh, in surface testing, when you are flowing, if the conditions are right and everything is working fine and the well is stable, you will not see pressure fluctuation. If you start seeing well, uh, the pressure fluctuation, that means either the well is not stable or you have equipment malfunction that you need to check. Next question, uh, what are the primary and secondary barriers during uh, ideal well test operation? Uh, your primary uh, your primary barriers are your choke manifold and wellhead uh, equipment. That's your primary. You know that uh, you pressure tested that, and those are uh, able to withstand the full shutting pressure of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the wellhead uh, of the well. So that's your primary barriers. Uh, secondary barriers is uh, usually uh, something that is handled by the by the recrew that includes getting a killing the well uh, equipment uh, ready and stuff like that. But your primary is your choke and your, uh, your wellhead. Um, okay, so there's another question in a language that I do not understand here, but go to the next one. Uh, how can we test them on site? And what is the, the mini SF for the low pilot? Okay, for testing them in the well sites, it's easy. Uh, our oh, safety factor, okay. So uh, testing the uh, low pilot and high pilot in well site is super easy. Uh, you need, just need a dead weight tester. That's a piece of equipment that is used to, uh, to supply a constant and, and exact pressure uh, to, uh, to the equipment you want to, uh, to calibrate. So uh, what you do is you connect your, uh, your high pilot or low pilot to a dead weight tester to the ESD. This is actually before the, uh, during the rig up phase, before starting to operate, uh, to open the well. And uh, what you do is you start increasing the pressure in the uh, deadweight tester until you reach the set point of the high pilot and see if it activates the ESD. Uh, some clients require uh, this operation to be witnessed by one of the, uh, one of the uh, client representatives. So it's uh, something that is commonly done on the well site. It's calibrated at, uh, at the base to save time but it can be done in the well site to uh, under the uh, supervision of the client to make sure that your safety equipment is working properly. Safety factors, uh, for example, if you're, you want to protect an equipment that is uh, 1440 PSI, in case of the, uh, of the separator, you just go lower by about five or 10%. But uh, yeah, this, is, uh, this is mostly done during the uh, design phase. Uh, of the well test. So you know, for example, your separate is going to operating to be operating at 600 PSI or 500 PSI. You can set that where the uh, high pilot at 1000 in that case. But the safety factor is making sure that your high pilot or low pi uh, high pilot especially is going to actuate and close the well before uh, the, uh, the uh, maximum working pressure of the equipment you want to protect. You want to protect 1440 uh, PSI uh, separator, set it at lower than 1440 by about 10%. If you want to protect a, a surge tank, uh, which is 150 PSI, for example, you go lower. You set it at 120 meter, for example. All right. Yeah, can we adjust? The, yeah, well, it's, uh, it's done through these caps. These caps are uh, screwed uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise to increase or decrease the pressure uh, on the springs, the tension of the springs, for uh, for proper actuation at uh, at proper setting point, so they can be set from as low as fifty psi to as high as uh, ten thousand psi. Next step, if uh, depending on the uh, on the situation itself, uh, so uh, 
during the preparation phase of, uh, of, the, uh, of the tests, we go through what we call hazards. So uh, hazardous operation meetings and uh, preparation, and we'll have a full manual, a full procedure that covers every single dangerous situation we can be faced, off, uh, faced with. Example, uh, the, uh, the example we said about the low pilot activating during a floor line uh, rupture, that's in the hazards. So that means uh, we'll, we'll have a procedure to say, for example, the, the well is closed, ESG has closed, uh, shut down the well at SSV. That means the next operation will be to make sure that the uh, area is clear. Then we send the team to uh, check the, uh, the piping, remove that piping, get install new uh, new one, make sure that the well is uh, is well shut in and let's say it's safe. Uh, then we'll do an investigation work on the uh, failed uh, piece of equipment to make sure that uh, it's, it's not happening again and know uh, the reason why it happened. And then proceed from there to, uh, to make sure that uh, the operation is, uh, is carried on uh, safely. So uh, we have contingency plans and uh, procedures to, uh, to deal with any uh, unknowns during those uh, hazard operations. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. So uh, I think this is it for uh, ILO pilots. We now go to the next presentation. Which is about the soul and heart of uh, of well testing, which is the separators. <clears throat> Three phase test separators. So. Uh, we go about uh, the definition of separator, its location on the well test spread, selection criteria, components, principle of operation, and uh, safety uh, considerations. So, a three phase separator is at the heart of the well test. It's uh, the equipment that will allow us to separate the phases of the fluids and measure them and everything. So, it's going to improve the gravity separation process. Uh, using uh, internal components inside the vessel, and it will uh, get uh, get the separation done. It will measure the liquids and gas flow rates. It will calculate the shrinkage factor with a built-in shrinkage tester. It will adjust the separation parameters, uh, so that's uh, the separation pressure, the uh, the uh, level of uh, liquids inside the uh, the vessel, and this is done to improve the uh, separation efficiency. And we use it also to take oil, gas, and water samples from uh, different positions in the, uh, in the separator. So this is the location of the, uh, the separator and the well test spread. So that's the flow head, fluid comes through the safety valve, data header, choke. Sometimes if required, it goes through the heater, then into the separator. And uh, notice that it's only one line here, it goes in, the separator as a one line comes out as three. You'll have one line for the oil and one line for the gas and one line for the, uh, for the water line. So as we all know, the uh, three phases of uh, produced in, a, in an oil well or gas well are usually oil, water, and gas. So uh, we have multiple types of, uh, of uh, configurations of separators to, to take care of that. So there's uh, vertical separators, horizontal separators, and spherical separators. Vertical separators are good because they use less place and uh, less space than the horizontal separators for the same capacity. So if we have uh, three meter cubic meters uh, uh, separator, four cubic meter separators in a horizontal configuration, it's going to take more space than a vertical one. But on the uh, minus side, it's a bit tricky to to access. So usually to uh, to work on a vertical separator, you need multiple uh, multiple levels and uh, of like gratings and uh, railings around it to work. So taking a reading from uh, one part of it and uh, getting a sample from another part of it really require you to go up and down ladders. <clears throat> Horizontal separators are the most common ones uh, in all aspects of the industry. Uh, would it be uh, in uh, 
in uh, plants or in well tests or in mobile units, it's usually uh, done on, a on horizontal separators. It is the most efficient at handling large amount of gas because the volume dedicated to uh, gas separation is higher because of the horizontal configuration of the, uh, of the separator. And it is the most economical uh, because it can handle uh, uh, emulsions better form and uh, high gas oil ratios uh, much better because as I said, it's going to give more space, uh, horizontal space to the, those phases to be separated. The next one, uh, which is less common actually than the vertical or the horizontal is the spherical uh, separator. It is the most efficient for containing pressure and that's for uh, physics, science reason. Sphe uh, spheres are uh, going to uh, spread the uh, pressure evenly on all sides and have less uh, weak spots. So, uh, <coughs> sorry, for vertical uh, vertical separators or horizontal separators, the weakest part of the of the vessel usually it's the uh, elongated part. The uh, spherical part is the the toughest. So, by having the same exact uniform uh, shape all around the separator will allow us to uh, to to get more pressure. But uh, they are not widely used for obvious reasons, which is having less capacity and uh, fabrication is, is, uh, is a bit tricky to get, uh, to get the building right. And even during operation, due to the uh, odd shape, uh, controlling it and, uh, is, is a bit tricky. So this is one, uh, one example of uh, horizontal separator. It's one of the most common ones used. Uh, selection criteria is based uh, usually on the pressure and temperature rating. So uh, how much pressure is going to operate? The most common ones is 1440 PSI, but there's also low pressure separators being used uh, at seven or 900 PSI. And uh, one of their advantages is being like lightweight. Lighter, uh, less pressure to be uh, handled means that you can use less material and it will make the separators lighter, allow them to be mounted, for example, on trailers. The next selection criteria is uh, fluent uh, fluids characteristics. Are we going to be flowing uh, a heavy oil? For example, are we going to be uh, flowing uh, high rates of gas? Uh, are we going to be uh, flowing uh, uh, high temperatures? So that's going to be effort to, to affect the selection of the separator. Flowing high, uh, high gas rates usually requires larger vessels and uh, also bigger uh, gas outlets. It can go all the way to six inches in some uh, in some cases. If we are going to uh, to be flowing also uh, uh, high viscosity oil, uh, it's also uh, it goes into consideration. So in that case, we need like special probably uh, meters for that. Fluid capacity that's the total fluid capacity, flow meter type, and weight and uh, foot uh, footprint considerations. That's uh, taking uh, care of during the design phase. So. Let's dive into the separator now and uh, see uh, the internal components. So the flow will enter here and it's uh, mixed oil, water, and gas. And to exit the, uh, the separator from the oil outlet, the water outlet and gas outlet totally separated. So uh, the normal uh, configuration would be, we'll start with the deflector plate. It's one plate right at the beginning of the separator and it's facing the, uh, the, uh, the inlet. The uh, flow will strike the uh, deflector plate, gets deflected, slowed down, and that's responsible for probably 95% of the uh, actual separation. That decrease in speed will uh, separate gas from oil and water. So gas goes up, liquids fall down. The most basic type is uh, just a plate. It's a plate welded, uh, facing the flow path. Most complex, as well, complex ones uh, will have what we call clusters. So a cluster is uh, a number of plates arranged in a, well, in a way that will deflect the, uh, the incoming fluid in multiple ways that have been modeled uh, uh, prior to that, and which allow to increase the separation uh, efficiency from 95% to, uh, to higher. So the uh, most recent uh, separators usually do not have a deflector plate, but uh, uh, a deflector uh, cluster. 
After that, we'll have the coalescing plates. So the coalescing plates are here, right in the middle of uh, the separator. And uh, what are what the coalescing plates are? The um, uh, kind of a fishbone structure of uh, uh, superposed uh, plates onto which the uh, droplets of oil and water will coalesce together and drop down to the bottom of the uh, vessel. We'll have a foam breaker over here. It will just break the uh, formation of foam and allow us to have gas with less droplets in it. We'll have a mystic structure right at the beginning of uh, the gas outlet, at the start of the gas outlet, that will extract uh, the last remaining drops of oil and get them into the uh, oil level, uh, oil uh, compartment. We'll have a weir plate separating the oil compartment over here from the water compartment and vortex breakers at the outlets to, uh, to prevent the formation of, uh, of uh, vortex that can suck in either gas or oil to the wrong, uh, to the wrong outlet. So this is our plate, as you can see. This is the old generation, which is always a, a simple plate, but can be uh, can be replaced by uh, by clusters. Next are the coalescing plates. As you can see, these are the fishbone structure. So plates will just drop here. Uh, droplets will drop onto the coalescing plates, and then smaller plates, uh, smaller droplets will touch each other, each other and become bigger, and will just drop to the uh, bottom of the. Uh, to the bottom of the vessel. Next, the foam breaker. It's a kind of a wire mesh and it's right after the coalescing plates. So we may have a level of, uh, of oil and water in here, but because of the gas and some properties of the fluids being produced, the, uh, the oil can be foaming. So it's just like a foam of, uh, of soap. Uh, and it, when it passes through, the uh, wire mesh of the uh, of the foam breaker, it will act just like a sieve. So it's like uh, it's going to pop those uh, small bubbles. Gas goes up, and the remaining fluid drops down and goes to the uh, oil layer. <clears throat> Next up is the mystic structure. and so this here is the outlet of the uh, the gas outlet of the separator, and uh, whatever you do during the separation process, you'll always have small droplets of, uh, of oil still, cut, uh, still uh, caught in the, uh, in the gas. And because it's flowing, it can be carried away. So the, uh, the mystic structure is some kind of uh, uh, netting, a wire mesh that is installed right at the outlet. And what it does is it's going to catch the last remaining uh, droplets and coalesce them and drop them into the uh, oil compartment. The weight plate, which is here, is just a big plate welded into the uh, internal part of a wall of the uh, of the separator at a certain height. So this is the uh, one of the uh, most traditional ways to uh, to build separators with the with the weight plate. So what happens is water, which is heavier. Uh, denser actually than, than oil will be trapped here and oil will overflow the oil plate and drop into this compartment. This is the oil compartment and this is water compartment. So by controlling the, out, uh, the outlet of uh, oil uh, of water here and the outlet of oil, we can control the levels of the respective fluids and we'll have 100% oil here and water at the bottom of the uh, water compartment. And the weight plate function is to separate that. It will separate between these two compartments. Usually it can be, uh, it has like a fixed uh, height, but uh, during preparation, it can be uh, in some models of separators, uh, it can be uh, adjusted. We can install like higher uh, weight plates to accommodate for a higher fluids, uh, liquid, liquid fluid uh, here. Uh, new technology separators, most modern ones, will have a collector, which is um, like a pipe, mobile pipe with a, with, a, with, a, with a mobile inlet inside the separator that goes up and down. And that one will be matched in the uh, oil layer thickness to allow for larger volumes of oil to be processed. After that, we are talking about the uh, vortex breaker. 
and uh, the name is uh, is uh, is really meaningful here. It breaks vortex, so it's an X or some other shape that is placed on top of the oil outlet over here, and what it does is it prevents the uh, oil, for example, in this case here, from uh, swirling. So we'll have like we don't have a vert vortex because if a vortex happens, it will reduce the uh, it will send some gas from this compartment into the oil outlet and uh, through uh, the oil outlet to uh, to your meters. Some meters will not be able to handle uh, gas into the uh, inside the oil line. It can damage them. So you'll have vortex breakers to uh, to avoid having vortexes and. Uh, uh, having contamination. Same thing is also for the water line. You'll have a vortex breaker to avoid getting oil into the uh, the water uh, water line. For uh, in this case, it's mostly for to avoid having uh, wrong uh, wrong readings or contamination of water with oil. Next, we're talking about meters now. So the uh, the, the separators' uh, main purpose is to separate three phases oil, gas, and water, and to, uh, to, to get a uh, correct uh, and uh, precise uh, metering. So oil meters are made on uh, in, in different, uh, uh, different types. You can have rotor type vortex meters. So they are used for high flow rates. You can have uh, positive displacement meters. That's for low flow. You can have turbine meters. And uh, the most modern ones, uh, separators use uh, Coriolis mass rate meters. For, uh, for gas meters on the gas line, we might have a Daniel orifice box. That's uh, one of the most traditional ways to, uh, to, uh, to measure the, uh, the oil, uh, the gas rates. Or you can have a Coriolis mass, uh, mass rate meter. For water rate measurement, we can have a Floco type positive displacement meter. We can have a Coriolis mass rate meter. And uh, we also can have electromagnetic meters that take advantage of the salinity of uh, the uh, electromagnetic properties of, uh, of water to be uh, to be able to measure the uh, the rate. So these are two of the most common types: the positive displacement meter on the right, and the vortex meter on the on the left. So positive displacement is uh, metering how many packets, how many packets of fluid are sent through the meter. So there is like a two, uh, there's a three blades here, and each blade is equipped with a seal. And when the flow flows through the blades, it will push this compartment and rotate the, uh, the rotor. So this packet goes all the way here and all the way out. So knowing that the, uh, the volume of this part, we can determine how much fluid is flowing through the uh, meter by knowing the number of rotations. So if we know each rotation will send three packets that, and that will measure the volume. So that's the positive displacement meter. It's not good for high rates because the, that means that the uh, rotor will spin at very high uh, velocity. And when it does so, it will damage the bridge seals. And if the seals are the uh, rotor seals, and if those are damaged, we are not going to be measuring uh, the correct uh, uh, volume of these packets. So that's why you don't want to use uh, high rates on, uh, on positive displacement uh, meters. That's one thing. Second thing is that's also one of the reasons you don't want to send gas to the oil line, for example, because if gas goes through uh, your oil meter, which is a positive displacement here, is going to send this rotor spinning so fast that it's also going to damage the uh, damage the, uh, the seals and totally destroy your equipment. Next type is the vortex meter. So uh, vortex meters take advantage of the, uh, the rotation of uh, the rotor here, but not through uh, the packets. So uh, the flow goes Goes through two uh, uh, through through two uh, two parts separated by a septum here. One is unaffected by uh, by the rotor, and one is. So uh, during calibration, we will can we can calibrate the uh, the rotors, the, uh, the readings 
So how many rotation you have compared to how many fluid uh, volume you get. So it does not actually measure packets, but it's cor it correlates the uh, the rotation of the uh, of the rotor inside its vortex chamber to the uh, to the actual uh, uh, volume measured. So these are two mechanical uh, types of uh, measuring device. The most modern one is actually the Coriolis gas meter. The Coriolis gas meter is going to uh, to detect to detect mass flow. So it's not volumetric uh, measurement. It's uh, it's a mass flow uh, measurement, and then it can be extrapolated to volumetric measurement. And what it does is it takes advantage of the Coriolis effect that uh, that affects tubes of uh, of steel here that are uh, having uh, a fluid pass through them. So each of uh, these uh, these uh, tubes here have a natural vibrating frequency. So we have drive coils that uh, induce vibration. And what happens is when flow goes through these, it will affect and change the, uh, the frequency of vibration and the mode of vibration and the twist angle of those tubes based on the mass flow rate. There's multiple things that go inside the calculation here, but uh, the, the takeaway, the basic takeaway is, is going to change the, uh, the uh, frequency detected through the peak of course, and it will be correlated to mass flow rate. So when you take samples later of, the, uh, of your liquids and you know the, uh, the densities, you can, you can convert directly the mass flow rate to, uh, to uh, actual uh, precise uh, volumetric uh, flow rates. So that's the Coriolis meters. And they, can, they come in multiple shapes and forms. Some of them have this, uh, this uh, distinct U-shaped, some have this, uh, this shape, some are like more streamlined, but they all take the advantage of the same basic Coriolis effect. The other type is a turbine all meter, turbine uh, meter. It's, uh, as I said, uh, this one is also mechanical, but it's, uh, it's a bit more modern than the other types. Instead of uh, having the, uh, the rotation go on this axis, the rotation happens along this axis, longitudinal axis. So there is a rotor, and that rotor is going to, uh, to be rotating uh, proportionally to the, uh, to the amount of fluid going through. This will be detected through a magnetic pickup, and that will be transmitted to the acquisition system and converted to, uh, to actual uh, flow rates, liquid flow rates. So uh, the, uh, the uh, turbine orbiters, vortex meters, and positive displacement meters are fluid for liquid, uh, liquid phases, so oil and water. The Coriolis can work for oil, gas, and water. So now we go to gas measurement. The most common, and this is one of the oldest ways to, uh, to measure gas rates, uh, has always been the uh, gas orifice meter. Uh, and it's sometimes called, in the, called the Barton box or Daniel box because those were the first brands uh, to be uh, to be uh, commercialized, and everyone knows them by that name. So uh, it will measure using a type of differential pressure meter, and will have a calibrated small orifice that will be inserted into the flight path. So uh, the uh, the flow path. So the gas will flow through this orifice, orifice plates, and uh, there will be a differential pressure between upstream of the orifice plates and downstream of the orifice, orifice plates. And that can be used to calculate <coughs> the, uh, the gas flow rate. So the box has two compartments, one on top, this is the top compartment, and there is the lower compartment right below this. And uh, there's a gate valve in between, sliding valve that is used to isolate the top from the lower bottom, uh, lower half of the meter to allow the insertion and the retrieval of, uh, of the orifice plates. This is how it looks in real life. So we'll have a top chamber, lower chamber, bunch of hoses going to a collector here, that's a manifold, and goes to a button recorder, shot recorder that we record the uh, the pressure of the vessel and the differential pressure and also sometimes the temperature. So it measures the gas pressure with S. So it's differential and uh, static and gas temperature. 
So the high pressure is connected to the upstream side. That's the upstream side. And the low pressure is connected to the downstream side of the, uh, of the Daniel box. And it's all recorded in the chart. So later when we pick up the chart, we'll have a differential chart, a differential uh, curve, differential pressure curve. It's usually uh, calculated in inch of water. We'll have a static pressure and it is measured here downstream of the uh, orifice meter. And we'll have also a gas, uh, a gas temperature. So these are important information we can be used, that can be used later along with other formations to, uh, to calculate the, uh, the, uh, the gas uh, flow rate. At the backside of the meter, we'll have uh, scrubbers. And uh, one of the, uh, the reasons to have scrubbers is because we always have some kind of contamination droplets, maybe of, of oil getting, getting uh, carried away by the, uh, by the gas coming out of the separator. So we do our best to avoid having uh, uh, oil droplets, but if that happens, we don't want that uh, oil to be trapped in these lines going to the, uh, to the uh, differential uh, pressure recorder. So what will happen is we have like two small vessels called scrubbers. They can be behind the uh, meter or in front of it. And uh, they, are, they are kind of an expansion volume that allows the accumulation of uh, oil, oil droplets. So the gas comes here and goes to the top and some droplets will just fall off and accumulate here. And every now and then, the uh, chief operator or the, uh, the engineer in charge there will just check the levels of the scrubbers. And if he sees any uh, amount of fluid here, it needs to be flushed off. So that ensures that we have clean and uh, consistent pressure going to the differential pressure recorder without being contaminated. And uh, the issue is, if we have liquids going there, the differential sometimes is so small that even the head like the, uh, the amount of static pressure uh, generated by the contamination can, can, uh, can get us uh, wrong readings. So now we'll go to the uh, separation process uh, and the importance of, uh, of the settings, how to set your separator properly to allow for perfect uh, separation. So as we said, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, fluid will just hit first the uh, coalescing plate, the uh, deflector plate or the cluster, and then separate. We'll have gas, oil, and water. So what dictates the quality of your, uh, your separation is how much can you slow down the flow inside the separator. So that's translated into retention time, how much time can you uh, keep one droplet of oil, for example, inside the separator between the moment it, it, it enters to the moment it uh, gets out of the oil outlet? So it's uh, usually calculated by how much volume you have inside the, uh, the separator of oil, for example, and uh, based on the flow rate. The higher retention time you have, the better separation uh, will be. So the liquid, the level of liquid uh, gas interface should be kept constant to maintain steady separation conditions. You don't want to have a uh, fluctuation in, uh, in, in separation, uh, in the separator level. Fluctuation separated level means fluctuation in retention time. And that fluctuation means that you are not getting consistent uh, quality of gas coming out, consistent quality of oil coming out. That means that your gas, for example, in one slug will be enriched in oil, and the other one, the other next slug will be less oil. So uh, the uh, the uh, the measurement will not be precise. So you need perfect, steady conditions in the separator. So you need to maintain your level. So the initial set point for the liquid gas depends on the gas oil ratio of the well effluent. That's the GOR. So that's the one term that you will hear uh, very often: gas oil ratio. For high GOR. That means you have gas, high gas oil ratio, more volume in the separator is reserved for gas. So for example, if you have a gas well, so it's producing way more gas than, uh, than oil. Let's say it's producing 40 million scuffs a day of, uh, of gas, and it's only producing uh, 600 barrels of oil uh, per day. 
So you want the best quality separation for gas. In that case, you're going to set your oil level as low as possible. So probably right around the height of the wire plate. So that ensures that we have the maximum possible volume for gas separation. But on the other hand, if you have low GOR, that means you are probably reduce, producing uh, close to that oil and uh, or you're producing uh, heavy oil. So in that case, you probably have a gas rate of five or six million scuffs a day and uh, an oil production of uh, 6,000 barrels a day. In that case, you want the best quality of separation for your oil, not for gas. So in that case, you increase the level of the liquid inside the separator that gives more volume for oil to separate and, uh, and gets a consistent uh, level. So the most important thing is set it once and respect that setting for the remaining of the test, if possible. Sometimes you cannot really uh, uh, maintain the same setting for operational reasons, but whenever possible, try to get the same setting steady for, for once and keep it there. So as a guideline, the level is initially fixed. That's so to start at the middle. And then depending on the GWAR, that's uh, especially uh, relevant in the exploration wells, then you can uh, start fiddling with it, increasing it or decreasing it to suit the, uh, the operation. So once that's, uh, that's set and we are in the main uh, test uh, phase, we can uh, focus later on the shrinkage tester. So uh, as we already uh, discussed earlier, uh, the, uh, the oil is always uh, having some gas in it, dissolved in it, because it is still under pressure. It is not dead oil. So uh, if we get that oil from the separator condition out to the uh, standard condition, which is atmospheric, atmospheric pressure and, uh, and, uh, 15, and uh, uh, atmospheric uh, temperature, also room temperature. So what happens is the gas will escape the oil and the volume of the oil will, uh, will be reduced. So if we are measuring, for example, uh, uh, 10,000 barrels a day of, uh, of oil in separator conditions with our meters, that does not mean that we, uh, the, uh, the client will be able to collect 10,000 barrels of, uh, of dead oil in his tanks. That oil will shrink when it's uh, moved from separator to uh, ambient conditions. And to account for that shrinkage, uh, we need to use a shrinkage tester. So a shrinkage tester is a small vessel containing two big scrubbers, or big uh, expansion chambers uh, that is uh, connected to the separator through the side glass. And what happens is we will first pressurize the, uh, the uh, shrinkage tester to the pressure of the separator. We'll just put all the valves open and fill it up with gas so it's equalizing with the separator. In that case, we'll have the same exact conditions of the separator. It is then filled up to the same level as the separator with oil. So it's like uh, having a cake and taking a slice of that cake and that's representative. So in this case, it's like we are taking a slice of the conditions of the separator level and uh, pressure and, uh, and temperature and everything into the shrinkage tester. And then we isolate that slice. We close these valves and we slowly, extremely slowly, start decreasing the pressure of the shrinkage tester. Uh, and what that thing is going to do is, it's going to uh, reduce the pressure on the oil that will start giving off all the trapped gas. That gas will escape to the atmosphere and the, uh, the oil will shrink. That shrinkage is going to be accounted for as a shrinkage factor in our rate uh, calculations. Because when we are going to, produ to produce the report and give it to the client, we are going to give him the standard condition flow rates. So the shrinkage test is used to, uh, to get this first correction factor. There's uh, a bunch of correction factors used actually, but this is one of the important ones. So that's how you get your shrinkage test around. So the uh, operational tips for separators is to pass the flow when the flow is uh, when the well is sufficiently clean to avoid to avoid uh, damage to the vessel and poor performance. What this means is 
after the cleanup, we make sure that we don't have, for example, solids coming back to the surface, because if we are having lots of solids, BSW is high, we might be uh, running into the risk of uh, having more solids going to the separator and getting trapped there and reducing our separation volume. That is bad. It can also damage the, uh, the equipment. So we need to make sure that we the well is sufficiently uh, stable and, uh, and clean. Uh, and that's also uh, ensuring that uh, the, the well is uh, technically flowing from the reservoir. So when we start metering, that's uh, the, the, the measuring is uh, the measurement is, is correct. We also need to verify the set pressure and make sure it does not affect flow, uh, critical flow conditions. As I said, there's uh, certain requirements uh, between the downstream pressure of the choke and the upstream pressure of the choke. And uh, setting the pressure of the separator will affect downstream pressure of the, uh, of the choke, obviously. So we need to make sure that it's still respecting the critical flow. We uh, do not want to bypass the separator when changing chokes. We we'll just need to monitor the liquid levels and try to keep the process stable for compatibility reasons. So when we increase the choke during the main flow, for example, we start at uh, 32 and start increasing to 40, for example, we want to keep the same conditions in the separator, pressure, levels, and everything. And uh, that's for, uh, for the reason is to compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges. Uh, flowing at 32, for example, uh, choke size at a 600 PSI pressure, and then increasing to 400 p to 40 p 64 uh, fixed choke, and then suddenly the pressure in the separator is 800. We are not comparing the same conditions. We want to keep the same conditions between each choke. So we try to uh, to keep that in mind. Do not alter separator conditions while taking PVT samples. This is uh, this is a very very important point. Uh, so during the PVT sampling operation, it can take like uh, one hour two hours you want to keep this, the, the conditions as stable as possible because the, uh, the, uh, the sampling will take into consideration the pressure of the vessel, the, uh, the temperatures, uh, the, uh, the, the, that flow rates, because it's only all going to correlate to, uh, to each other later during, uh, in, the, in the lab, uh, the combination, for example. And if you change the condition mid-sample, your, your sample is basically ruined. It's, uh, it's not going to be uh, super representative. Do not bypass separator before shutting the well. Doing so can compromise critical flow conditions, which will uh, affect downhole data. So, what we the way we usually do uh, when we want to shut to the, to shut in the well for the final buildup, for example, so we'll be metering through the, our separator, and then the decision comes to shut the well. One guy will just bypass mechanical meters, only mechanical meters. Will bypass mechanical meters of the separator to avoid any damage. And then we close the well as fast as possible and while flowing through the separator. Once that's done, we can uh, deal with uh, the contents of the separator later on. We also need to tag out the air lines to the separator to ensure the uh, air supply is not accidentally shut down. Uh, so if one of the recrew, for example, wants to, uh, to disconnect a hose to, to do something with it, he's not going to inadvertently uh, shut down the, uh, the hose from uh, from the uh, separator. And what happens is if we shut down the hose to the separator, the, uh, the, uh, the control valves will all default to their uh, fail-safe uh, condition. What that means is, for example, the oil, uh, the oil control uh, valve, the ACV, is normally closed. So if we don't have any air supply going to the, uh, to the valve, it will shut down. The gas ACV, on the other hand, automatic control valve is normally opened, obviously for safe reason, uh, for safety reasons. If the air uh, pressure drops, the air supply is shut down. The uh, ACV will default to open position and bleed off any gas and any pressure. So it's not going to build up any pressure at the separator. So losing the uh, the air supply to the separator means means losing uh, control of uh, of the separator. So the safety, uh, safety considerations. So after each job, the separator must thoroughly clean. Uh, this is especially, especially important after stimulation. Uh, acid stimulation will uh, inv involve uh, pumping acid into the formation to, uh, to dissolve uh, calcium carbonates, for example, and then pumping uh, some uh, 
uh, inhibitors and also pumping uh, uh, other chemicals. Everything, and neutralizing agents, everything will come back to the surface at some point. So that acid, neutralizing agents, additives, everything will go back to the separator. So after each job, especially with the, as I said, the PS stimulation jobs, it needs to be open. The manhole needs to be open and needs to be cleaned from well effluents. Uh, the set pressure and calibration date must be checked before every job. So uh, the uh, the clients usually will require uh, the uh, the test uh, certificates, the calibration for the uh, for the PSVs, for example. It needs to be controlled by a third party usually. We need to make sure that uh, the lifting eyes of the separator and frame and uh, lifting slings and accessories are in perfect condition. Uh, because uh, when we are going to rig up the equipment, it's uh, we're talking about like 16, 17 tons equipment. So the certificate, uh, certification needs to be valid. The inspection needs to be carried out right after the, uh, right before lifting to check if uh, the equipment had been damaged during transportation. And we have to remove, during transportation, you have to remove the floats. So these floats are used to control the, uh, the level of uh, liquid inside the separator. We go over two questions, guys. So. Okay, first question was from Faraj. If we flush the scrubber too many times, will it affect the shot? Yes. Uh, flushing uh, flushing the, uh, the scrubber will change the, uh, the DP the differential pressure if the scrubbers are not isolated. So the, uh, the scrubbers have isolation valves on top. So you close them to do the, uh, to, uh, to change, to, to flush the scrubber. While the isolation valves are closed, you are not reading uh, differential pressure. That's one thing. Uh, second, if you don't do it properly, like if you, uh, you miss, uh, if you open one of the uh, valves and keep the other one closed, you are going to apply the full, uh, the full pressure on the DP cell from one side, especially if you have a small leak in the other side. So that, uh, that can damage the cell. So you have to do it only when required, only if you see an indication of, uh, of uh, uh, liquid buildup in the scrubbers. Yeah, the indication is that the scrubbers have a side glass. So you just check the side glass to see if there is level buildup, liquid buildup in the scrubbers. That's one thing. And uh, another thing is uh, to, to see if you have liquids inside the, uh, the hoses. And this happens uh, through the uh, DP. If, if you have like stable conditions, stable flow, stable static pressure, stable liquid flow, but you see that there is a drift in uh, DP, in differential pressure, that may be an indication that you have something wrong in your... Uh, in the, uh, inside the, uh, the DP cell or inside the hoses that needs to be checked. <clears throat> Next question is when do we have to remove the orifice plate? The orifice plate needs to be changed every time we, uh, I mean, it needs to be picked up and removed from the lower chamber every time the flow conditions in the separate are going to change. This includes changing the, uh, uh, changing, for example, the chokes. If you want to change the chokes, First, you need to bypass uh, your gas meter. So you bypass gas meter and pick up your uh, your orifice plate. And it also can be done if you are going to change the conditions of the separator. Say, for example, you are operating near the uh, near the maximum DP. For example, you are in a 400 uh, inch uh, of water DP cell. You are operating at 70% of the uh, DP range, and uh, you want to uh, decrease the pressure of the separator. Decreasing the pressure of the separator means you are going to open the automatic control valve of the gas more. That will increase the velocity of the gas in the gas line. So if you keep your orifice plate there while decreasing the pressure of the separator, you might run in the, into the risk of the gas pushing onto the plate so hard that it's going to be stripped from the carrier into the gas line. And that's like a big incident. So if you want to pressure change the conditions of the separator, pick up your uh, orifice plate, put it in the upper chamber, and then you can, uh, uh, you can change the, uh, the uh, separator conditions. Uh, Mohammed is asking uh, about the uh, PowerPoints. They are available through the, uh, the association, so you can uh, check later. Which steps are required from city aside and 
this side. Okay, for, for safety for safety inspections of the separator before the uh, opening the well, it's uh, it's a standard procedure. Normally, if you uh, you are doing a well test uh, well test course, for example, that's one of the uh, one of the procedures that get drilled into you. You have to do a full work around of the equipment uh, before starting. You have to you will check the position of the valves. You will check the air supply uh, before everything. You know that your equipment is certified. It has been pressure tested. Uh, you check the uh, that your float, if you're using the, if you're not using a radar, using a float system, you check your floats are well connected. You have to check your beaters. You have to check your lineup. The position of each valve needs to be uh, checked. Your uh, inlet valve, your bypass valves for oil and gas and water, the outlet valve positions. Uh, you need to check also the position of the uh, safety ball valves on the uh, side glass. So you do you do a full work around of uh, of the separator, checking every component and every uh, sub component uh, subsystem of the separator before opening the well. And that's usually the uh, part of the uh, responsibilities of the crew chief. Usama is asking how much is the uh, pressure in the separator in normal cases. Uh, it depends. It depends. You have an operating range. Uh, most of the time, it's from 0 to 1,440 PSI. But uh, you will operate uh, under, uh, under some constraints. First, you have to respect the uh, critical flow. That's one. Depends on the flow conditions. Uh, sometimes you will need higher pressure to separate to uh, to avoid having uh, foaming, for example. Sometimes you uh, you can uh, have uh, lower pressure to have less of uh, GUR two because you have two GURs, one GUR based on the separator uh, rates, and GUR two is when you have uh, 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 shrinkage in the uh, in the backside, in the uh, at the back end in the surge tank. So adjusting the pressure of the separator depends on the flow conditions. Uh, you want it as low as possible to uh, to uh, to account for the uh, uh, critical flow. That's one. You don't want it to be too low uh, and induce uh, the formation of uh, hydrates, because if you have very low pressure at the separator and very high pressure at the uh, at the choke manifold, you run into the risk of uh, creating hydrates at the choke. So you might want to increase in that case the, uh, the pressure at the separator. Uh, also, you uh, you have to take into consideration uh, temperature and uh, and everything. So it's a balanced act between uh, critical flow, temperatures, and, uh, and stability of the separator. You also don't want to uh, to set the pressure too low at your first choke, so that if you increase the choke later, the uh, you can keep the same pressure at the separator. So for example, if you are flowing at, uh, I come back to the same example again, uh, thirty to sixty four fixed choke. And then suddenly, you uh, after that, you want to increase to 40. If you had your separator set at the lowest possible pressure at 32, you are not going to be able to keep it at, uh, at 40. So you need to, uh, to take that into consideration. OK, next question is how to test in separator if the well is uh, in search flow, that's uh, if the well, the well is slugging. Uh, it's uh, it's very well uh, well dependent. It depends on the condition of the well. Uh, you might want to uh, to uh, to have more unloading. That means if you want to uh, to open the choke more, sometimes it's it helps if you do uh, the uh, the opposite side. If uh, if for example the bubble point happens in the uh, in the uh, column before hitting the surface, uh, you want probably to increase it, your uh, your choke, uh, your choke, like your back pressure, yeah, increase, decreasing the choke size. So that's one of the uh, tactics you can use. Then you adjust your separator accordingly. Uh, otherwise, if the well is uh, slugging fluids mostly, uh, you might want to increase a little bit of uh, the uh, level of the separator to uh, to uh, to address that. You want also to uh, to check your proportional band in the setting of the uh, ACV wizard. So there's lots of things that can be done to uh, account for uh, slugging. Ravi is asking, since we need the retention time for the separation of oil, gas, and water, is the separation process a continuous process or a batch wise? No, it's continuous. It's uh, it's full time continuous. Doesn't it's not a, a, we don't uh, isolate the separator separate. The uh, the uh, what, what we mean by uh, retention time is we consider a hypothetical uh, drop of oil entering the separator, and then how much time does it take for that drop of oil to, to come out? 
and uh, mathematically it's based on the volume of oil contained at any given time in the separator uh, by the uh, time uh, by the flow rate. Sahil is asking about liquid surge. Yeah, it's like a slugging. Okay, Sami is asking about shrinkage. Shrinkage is, uh, as I said, uh, is uh, the behavior of oil after exiting the separator. It is being separated from water and gas at the separator under pressure, 300, 400, 600 PSI. So it, when it comes out of the separator, that pressure and goes into a tank for storage is going to shrink because some of the gas is still contained at that pressure inside the, uh, inside the, uh, the oil. So it's that oil is going to send all that uh, to lose all that gas, and it will lose volume because of that. Mohamed Aziz is asking uh, how to get the optimal separator pressure condition during operation once the well is in critical flow. As I said, you need to see uh, your uh, first of all your uh, test program to know how many chokes you're gonna uh, you're gonna use and what's the biggest choke and take that into consideration in setting the, uh, the pressure. So you want to set the pressure that can be achieved in all those uh, chokes. You don't want to be, uh, because usually we start with the smaller chokes first and we go to the bigger one, bigger one, bigger one and setting uh, pressure at the lowest uh, choke size, uh, the lowest pressure at the lowest choke size means that when we increase the choke size, we are not going to be able to keep the same uh, separating pressure. So you take that into consideration, that's one. Uh, you take also into consideration the critical flow and you can, you can take into consideration also the effect of pressure on the temperature downstream of the choke. So if you set the, your pressure too low, as I said, you're going to create, because of the decompression, you're going to create a drop in temperature that can cause the formation of hydrates. Faraj is asking in cold conditions, we have to use the steam and that will cause more. Okay, I think this was based on another information, uh, another question. Sahil is asking, which separator is better? Horizontal or vertical separation? Uh, the, for, for gas, it's definitely the, uh, the horizontal. And that's the most common. Uh, vertical separators are usually used for like very extremely low uh, rates. And sometimes they even call like scrubbers. Uh, so it's like a vertical uh, vessel it's for low rate and it gets more gas, uh, more gas out of the fluid better maybe. But for uh, all, all purposes, usually the uh, horizontal is the, the, the much better uh, design. And that's why uh, the industry, the whole industry is mostly using uh, horizontal separation. Um, Rashid, the uh, training material is available. Uh, you just need to check with, uh, uh, with the guys who uh, prepared, the, uh, prepared the, uh, the course. So next, if the oil in the separator goes below the, uh, the, uh, the wheel play, uh, how can the oil then flow to the virtual sprayer? Oh, okay. So uh, the uh, the oil does not go below the uh, width plate. The width plate. The width plate is set. Let's go back here to the picture. So that's the weir plate. The weir plate. Uh, the weir plate is 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 made in a way so that water is kept here because it's denser, and we have the uh, the uh, water rate is set and controlled through uh, through the uh, water ACV if you have one. So what happens is we want to keep the water level here below the wear plate so it does not go over the wear plate. And any uh, all oil, the remaining oil will go over the water, over the plate into the oil compartment here. So that's how, uh, that's how it works. We keep a steady level of, uh, of water. If there's water, go, if there's water more going into the separator, we'll open this valve and water will exit. If there's no water coming in, this valve will automatically close and it will keep the, uh, the water level stable. If the water level is stable, the oil level is also stable. It goes up and it's carried away in the uh, oil line. Ibim is asking about uh, also 
uh, does the pressure of the flow rate determine the type of oil meter? No, only the flow rate, uh, the flow rate determines that because the, uh, the whole separate is operating at the same uh, operating pressure. So if it's a 1440 PSI uh, uh, vessel, the, uh, the meters can operate at 1440 PSI. Okay, so the uh, Hisham is asking the physical meaning of separator pressure. So that's the pressure inside the separator. We have gauges attached to the separator. So the pressure inside here, inside the vessel is 500 PSI. So uh, it's equivalent to a 500 pounds of force applied to a uh, one square inch. How can we ensure clean fluid flow uh, I think you mean here from the separator. That means like, uh, how can we ensure proper separation? That's as I said, through uh, continuous monitoring of your levels and your pressure. And then you can make sure that uh, the, uh, the, the flow is, uh, is, uh, is stable and steady. Uh, clean fluid, if you mean clean, that's probably um, talking about BS and W and solids. In that case, if you have lots of solids coming up, you might want to use a sand filter. Okay, uh, Rashid is asking, what is the main standard procedure steps that should be implemented to get representative well test results? Uh, uh, usually it's uh, the, the procedure is quite long and that's something agreed upon with, uh, with the client before the test during the design phase. But um, the most important thing is to have the well clean first. So that means that you will have to flow it for sufficient time. Uh, you have to, uh, to make sure that your uh, uh, fluid properties are stable. That includes gas specific gravity, water density, salinity, oil and uh, oil uh, gravity also uh, should be uh, stable. That means like the, uh, we are getting representative fluids coming back from the uh, reservoir. Temperature also is a, is a good indication. Uh, once everything is stable, that means that we are flowing from the reservoir without uh, any contamination. And that in turn can be uh, exploited if we have stable uh, separator conditions to get uh, representative uh, data from the well. Okay. Uh, Sahil is asking a question, why streamlining or laminar flow is necessary before uh, rate measurement. Uh, this is talking about one part of the, uh, it's a piece of equipment that is uh, located inside the gas line uh, right before the, uh, the uh, orifice plate. And this is only uh, mostly, mostly important for uh, orifice plate. Um, those uh, veins are used, are used to convert maybe the possibility of turbine flow uh, into lamellar flow. Uh, because the, uh, the approximation we use and the theory we use behind uh, the, uh, behind the, uh, the orifice plate uh, meters uh, is, uh, is based upon a lamellar flow. If we have turbulent flow, the DP, differential pressure calculated across the, uh, the orifice plate is not only uh, the cause of uh, the because of the change in velocity. If you get, like, if you get the, the, uh, if you know the, uh, the theory behind it, the change in the velocity uh, and change in pressure is, uh, is mass rate uh, dependent. So if you have other fluctuations uh, of DP, differential pressure caused by a uh, turbulent flow, your measure measurement is wrong. So we need to, uh, the straightening veins to convert any turbulent flow in the gas line into lamellar flow. Uh, Satish is asking a good question, which is what is the uh, alternative for separator? Uh, if you don't need the separation, uh, you can use MPFMs, multiphase flow meters. That's something we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll cover tomorrow uh, in the second session, because this is, uh, this is the last, uh, last uh, slide for today. Tomorrow we'll cover the, uh, the, uh, the other session and cover MPFMs and other ancillary equipments. So we can use that. Sajuli is asking, with, uh, will rotor meters be a good replacement for the measurement of the oil and uh, water flow rates? Uh, lots of technologies are used actually for uh, measuring uh, oil and uh, liquid uh, rates. So uh, it depends, this is a balancing act between cost 
and uh, effectiveness. Uh, service companies usually get the equipment, they want to streamline their equipment. So they want to get the same supplier for, for meters, for example, or for, for different uh, segments. And some companies use different brands. So it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act between cost and, uh, and effectiveness. So what can be used, for example, for company A may be a different brand for company, uh, company B. So it can be uh, used. Adil is asking if uh, uh, he came late and is there recording? Yeah, uh, recordings are, uh, recordings are uh, available. And uh, again, I just refer you guys to the association uh, so they, uh, they can handle your, uh, your requests. Okay, Faraj is asking, how do we enter the separator safely? What must be do or what must be done after the well is clean and pressure and temperature is stable? So um, one of uh, one of the, th the things that usually happen if the uh, separator is not handled properly uh, is when someone, for example, opens the inlet valve for the separator quite abruptly. And that uh, in sudden increase of pressure in inside the separator may cause the pressure safety valves to pop off. So if you want to flow into the separator, you have to take your time, take it easy, open the valve, the inlet valve slowly, make sure that it's, uh, you don't have like any, uh, any uh, sudden increase of pressure. Your preparation of the separator needs to be flawless. Like the position of the uh, outlet valve for gas, for example, it needs to be open. You need to set your uh, ACVs properly. You need to make sure that uh, your uh, liners going to your to your gauges and your uh, uh, transmitters are all open and nothing is plugged. So once everything prepared is ready, you just go easy. You open your outlet valve, your inlet valve very slowly. Once you have equalized your pressure, then you start closing your bypass valve slowly. And then you just focus on uh, setting your separator. Start always by setting your pressure, making sure that your pressure is, uh, is good. Then set your, uh, your level. Rashid is asking, is there a mathematical way rather than a practical uh, shrinkage test calculation? Yes, uh, it's based on, uh, on approximations. So uh, there's, uh, there's lots of uh, models used to predict the uh, shrinkage factor uh, based on, uh, on, uh, on the specific gravity and temperature of, uh, of the oil. One of the, one of the most uh, famous uh, approximations is called by, by, a guy, uh, by, a, by a guy called Katz. That's the Katz approximation for, uh, for what the behavior of oil for its shrinkage. So there's multiple models for that. Soran is asking, if you have high GUR, can you install batch separators, i.e. more than one separator? Definitely, yes. Uh, one, uh, the, uh, one of the uh, uh, common techniques, especially in uh, plants like uh, 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 EPS, early production facilities, for example, or even like uh, collecting plants, is like they have separators uh, in stages. So uh, they will have one big separator at the beginning, that will handle most of the separation. And then the gas outlet from that separator goes into another separator. It can be like all the way to three separators. That's the, the maximum I've seen. So it goes to one, uh, from one separator to another, especially through the gas line. That's the most, uh, most uh, important separation because oil generally, even later when it goes back to the uh, storage tanks, it's just going to shrink and send the, the remaining gas away. Usama is asking, is there a software that can we use in well test operations? Uh, depends on what you want to do exactly. If you want to do simulation, uh, there's multiple uh, simulation uh, softwares. Uh, Advanced Talents Consulting, uh, the firm I, uh, I work with, uh, are working actually on, a, on a, an experimental one like that. And uh, there's some also uh, commercial softwares for, uh, for, uh, uh, for process simulation. Other softwares that can be used during the well test are mostly uh, acquisition software. And that's specific to the company, to the service company using it. Scala, for example. But the question is, uh, side glass for oil, how we divide it between plus six minus six? Uh, yeah, it's, base, it's, it's easy. That's uh, based on the number of bolts. <laughs> 
it's, uh, it's an old school uh, technique. How many bolts you read on the on the on the side glass? Adel is asking: Is the separation pressure is related to separator? And the separator is related to separator dimensions separator, or it can be affected by the reservoir pressure. The separation pressure is set by the operator itself. So uh, it's not, uh, it's based on the condition at surface. What is your wellhead pressure? What is your downstream pressure? What's your critical flow? And how much you can set your, uh, your separator? Uh, reservoir pressure is not, uh, is not really important here. Dida is asking, among vertical horizontal separators, which handles solids better? None of them. Uh, you are not supposed to be uh, flowing uh, solids into the separator or like freely avoid it. You can, prov uh, some manuals say you can flow uh, uh, like a well effluent if it has less than 1% BSNW, but that percentage does not talk about, uh, it's not talking about uh, quantity. So if you are flowing, uh, for example, high GWAR well, uh, you're flowing 30, 30 million scuffs a day of gas, and uh, 100 barrels a day of, uh, of liquid with 1% BSNW, that should be okay uh, for probably one or two days. It's not gonna fill up this compartment with solids anyway. But for example, if you are flowing a low GWAR well, uh, you're flowing uh, 10,000 barrels a day of oil and you have 1% uh, BSNW, that's a lot of solids going into the separator. So horizontal or vertical, you don't want to send lots of uh, solids into them because at the end of the day, you are going to open the manhole and start cleaning that thing up, or you might even run into problems where the water compartment is filled over with solids and everything is going to be carried away into the uh, oil, uh, oil line and your measurement uh, needs to take account of that. Satish is asking what type of uh, level instrument is used for interface level measurement and separator and all level measurement. Uh, the most common one is floats. You'll have a, you'll have a separate float tube uh, running parallel to the uh, running next to the separator and communication with the uh, compartment to be uh, to be uh, measured. And uh, the floats are calibrated, so the oil uh, oil float will float on the interface of uh, oil and, uh, and gas and the water float will float in the interface between oil and the water. Um, the, uh, the float of the total liquid level that goes between oil and, uh, and gas is quite, uh, quite precise because the different density between oil and gas is very big. So it can float easily, but the float between water and oil sometimes can be tricky because the densities are quite close sometimes. And, uh, so the most modern separators do not use floats, but use uh, either radars or conductivity probes, uh, other like electronic uh, devices to, uh, to check the, uh, the, the levels. So that's the most uh, modern ones. Uh, Mohamed Amrani is asking, is this course about uh, drill stem test? Uh, no, this is like mostly surface test and MPFMs, multifuse uh, flow meters. That's the one I'll be tackled tomorrow. But if you guys are interested in other, uh, in other aspects of, uh, of the industry, uh, we can provide, uh, of course, uh, more courses in, uh, in, uh, in other aspects. Sahil is asking, are there any facilities by which we can witness various measurements from separator on real-time basis remotely? Yes. Uh, some uh, service companies are providing real-time data monitoring services. So you'll have your team, a team doing the well tests uh, on-site and the data will be uh, transmitted uh, through uh, secure channels to a web interface for the clients to, uh, to uh, to, uh, to, to check and also use those uh, data in real time to make uh, informed uh, decisions uh, towards the, uh, the the rest of the test. Marwa is saying, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That's all my pleasure. Faraj is asking, how is that deficient in PVC? Uh, so um, as I said, uh, depends on the well condition. So uh, the other, for those who don't know, uh, maybe or who are not well testers, uh, Fisher is the brand of the uh, controller of the uh, automatic control valves, either for uh, the oil and, uh, and gas and, uh, and uh, water outlets of the separator. So 
setting uh, the uh, pressure control valve for the separator, you always think safety first. So what you want to do is like having it uh, opened, fully opened, and then crack it open slowly, slowly until you start seeing uh, the uh, the stem of the ACV moving. That means that your ACV is open, ready to be closed. So when you start operating the dial later, it will just start to uh, to affect the pressure of the separator. For oil, it's the other way around. You want it closed to ready to be open. So when the pressure starts to uh, the, when the level starts to increase, it will open slowly. Khaled, thank uh, thank you, Khaled. Thanks. Uh, is it any behavior or failure when overpressure gas occurred in separator stage? How can we make the process back into steady state? Okay, uh, I think you mean by overpressure. You mean if we increase the working, uh, if we uh, go over the uh, operating pressure of the separator. The separator is equipped with uh, usually a set of uh, um, PSVs, pressure safety valves, that will open to the uh, to the vent line. To the uh, uh, in case of overpressure, if that uh, thing is opened, the uh, the test needs to be stopped, and uh, the ACVs needs to be uh, the PCV, the PSVs needs to be replaced, and the pressure test needs to be carried on again. Uh, Shaheen is asking how we clean the separator after the operation is complete. Uh, we open the manhole at the back of the uh, of the vessel. And we uh, we access the inside of the, the separator to be cleaned. It's a long process. It takes uh, it takes a couple of days, long and exhausting and uh, and dirty, especially. Uh, sometimes you find lots of solids inside. Uh, um, you may find find uh, debris. You may find uh, uh, sediments, uh, also wax and stuff like that. So it takes some time to be cleaned. But it's done mostly uh, most of the time during the uh, maintenance process of the separator. Faraj is asking how we dump the separator. Uh, so after the end of the test, uh, you want to, to, to dump the content of the separator before uh, demobilizing. You don't want to uh, be sending the separator full of oil and water back to the base. So uh, the way I do it usually is I want to, uh, after the well is shut, right after the well is shut, the choke manifold is closed. And at that point, right after the, the pressure starts decreasing a little bit, I isolate the separator. So I try to keep some gas pressure in the separator first. By keeping the gas pressures in the separator, I'm be, I'll be able to push the oil and water in the separator into the surge tank or the storage tank. Once we have uh, emptied the, uh, the two parts, oil and water compartments, uh, we just bleed off the gas pressure and uh, get ready to demobilize. Sahil, I think I asked uh, that question about uh, the softwares. Thank you, guys. Fidel is asking, uh, how do we avoid solids from getting in the, the separation process and block the water outlet? So um, as I said, uh, if the well is producing solids, is producing sand, in that case, uh, what you want to do is reduce uh, the choke. Uh, so if you reduce the choke, you're going to increase the pressure at the wellhead. If you increase the wellhead pressure, that means you have less uh, differential pressure at the well bore and less uh, carrying capacity, less velocity into the uh, uh, DST string. So you won't be getting more uh, solids at surface. If you can, uh, if this can be helped, and you'll have to get uh, the solids will come anyway. You have to flow. In that case, you have to take into uh, into account the possibility of using either uh, a cyclonic descender or using a sand filter. Last question about CMF, okay, combined meter factor. Uh, so the combined meter factor is, uh, is used to correct. So the meter factor is, uh, is a correction factor applied to, uh, to the inaccuracy of some mechanical uh, measuring devices. So uh, for example, the flow core, the Rotron, or uh, less in, 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 less, uh, uh, in lesser cases, maybe also the uh, turbine meters. But uh, uh, the meter factor is a correction factor applied to the reading you get from a meter compared to a correct reading measured by a tank. So what you do in a meter factor is you want to flow a known volume through the meter to the tank. 
you flow, for example, 10 barrels of water to the tank. And then you read how much you have uh, in your uh, meter, uh, on your meter. So you have a correction factor between your meter and your, uh, and your, uh, and your tank. That gives you the, uh, the correction factor. A combined meter factor will remove the shrinkage aspect by flowing uh, oil instead of water through the meter, having it in the tank and then letting it shrink. So you take that measurement after the shrinkage in the tank and compare it to the measurement of the, of the oil meter. And then you know, okay, by flowing X amount, uh, by reading X amount on the, uh, on the meter, I'll have Y amount of dead oil in my, uh, in my search tank. Thank you, Shane, very much. Uh, Faraj is asking again, if you want to bleed off 1000 PSI after cold tubing a uh, certain operation, what is the right size to use? Oh man, this, this is uh, based on, uh, it's right there. Like when you're doing the operation, it's uh, based on the conditions of the, of the web. Sahil, thank you very much. Looking forward to, to seeing you also tomorrow. All right, guys.